The following is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. This is Scorpio Sky, and you are listening to the Keeping It Strong Style Podcast, and it is the best. Yo, this is Rich Ladder from One Nation Radio. This is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. We present to you the Ace of Podcasts, Keeping It Strong Style. Let's go. It's the Ace of Podcasts, Keeping It Strong Style. Covering New Japan, they ready to hold it down. Jeremy Donovan and the young boy Josh. Come and hit a job out in Burial the Frost. From the Tokyo Dome over to the G1. Social Suplex is a network where we can get it done. I'm a chiller. And let them have it Cause this is just an intro Keeping the strong style Six stars from the get go Boy Yeah from Tampa Bay To the Tokyo Dome This is Keeping It Strong Style With your host Jeremy Donovan And the young boy Joshua Smith And thank you for listening Welcome to Keeping It Strong Style The ace of podcasts On the Social Suplex Podcast Network Jeremy Donovan here With the young boy Josh Smith on today's show, we'll review Capital Collision, Collision in Philadelphia, and cover all this news in the world of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Please support our show by subscribing and following the Social Suplex Podcast Network or keeping it strong style on the podcast app of your choice and leaving a rating and review. You can also get all the podcasts over at socialsuplex.com. Check out our Pro Wrestling Tees store, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Social Suplex. That's where you can get your official Keeping It Strong style t-shirt. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider making a one-time or monthly donation by visiting SocialSuplex.com slash donate and clicking on the donate button under the Keeping It Strong style logo. This week's episode is brought to you by the NJPW EXT, the only Browser extension for njpwworld.com Frequently updated and with features like dark mode Improved translations and layouts Custom and shared playlists Synchronized viewing parties And much, much more It takes NJPW World to the next level You can visit njpwext.us today for details Young boy, uh, I got some news, man. We, we got we got um, a call from Gato. He says that there are not enough bullet clubs around. <laughs> he wants us to be the first podcast branch of the bullet club. So we are now keeping a strong style bullet club. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? Um. Pre tell what what does this all involve? <laughs> so we we have to come for our, our own hand signal. We can, we can't do a two sweet or, or the gun. <laughs> those, those are taken. So we have to have our, our own our own hand signal. Um, <laughs> we got to pick colors. I guess we'll, you know, we'll stick with the, you know, the red red and black from our logo. So you know, Bullet Club red and black. That that's who we are. We're Bullet Club Wolf Pack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be in the Bullet Club. I've disparaged, I've disparaged them a lot. <laughs> but we're our, our own branch, so we, we run our own Bullet Club, so we can make it cool. Will we be able to get unfettered access to the talent involved in the Bullet Club to come on this show? Uh, I guess it depends how we align. Or, or do we, <laughs> are, are we cool with Finley's crew? Are we cool with Jay White's crew? Are we cool with Fale's crew? It, it all depends. Can't we be like... Switzerland, like uh, the neutral bullet club where everybody do we get paid for this? No, That's the big question. Uh, I, I gotta talk to Gato and seal. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I, I 100% was not expecting this bit. Like, I'm crying a little bit. This is so stupid. <laughs> oh, oh man. Yo, that might be the funniest thing you've ever done on this show. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God. Uh, no, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, we we are not um, part of the Bullet Club. We don't have our own unit. Uh, but there's a lot of Bullet Club I, I, stuff going on right now. Whoa, whoa, whoa! You're saying we don't got units, like well. <laughs> we don't have a Bullet Club unit. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> 
Uh, Remember the time we went to, uh, we were at the RP Funding Center to watch Ring of Honor, and we're like, everyone's dressed in Bullet Club gear, but they're also having a gun show in the same building, and people are very confused, like, oh, you guys want to go down that way? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we're like, no, we're waiting to get into to the show. To the rest. Oh, no, the show's already happening. It's down there. <laughs> the guns wanna... are down there, Patty. <laughs> yes, a lot of Bullet Club. All right. Down that way. <laughs> I'll, the thing I remember about that trip is when we pull into the parking lot and the parking attendant's like, you know, we're paying for parking, and you're like, we're here to see wrestling. You know it's real, right? <laughs> she goes, I know. <laughs> oh, oh man. Gosh. Yo, one time, one time I was wearing my Bullet Club shirt, right? And um, I was down, we were in Ybor City watching... Uh, I don't know. Probably dub, like what, what's the evolve? I, no, it wasn't evolve. It was uh, FIP. Yeah, we were watching the FIP show at the Orpheum, and I'm outside catching a breath of fresh air, maybe uh, doing a little puff puff on a little smoke smoke whatever. And um, this gentleman, this homeless uh, fellow, comes up to me. He's like, "What's up, bro?" And I was like, "What's up, man?" And he was like, "Yo, I fucking love Donald Trump, bro." And I was like, all right. <laughs> and like, you know how like the, the homeless people in Ebor are like, they wild out. And he's like, yeah, bro, I fucking love Donald Trump, what he's doing for this country, bro. Like, I, he's my boy, you know? And I was like, okay. And he's like, can I get a smoke? And I was like, yeah. And then I was like, what? Why are you telling me about Donald Trump? And he was like, oh, I'm just trying to get in good with you. You're wearing one of his shirts, you know? And I was like, <laughs> And I was like, this is not a Donald Trump shirt. This is a professional wrestling shirt. There's a show in there. And he's like, oh, really? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, man, fuck Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, all right, man. Man. Never know. So, you're yeah. Getting, getting you're ready to talk about New Japan? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, first thing we got to talk about, uh, uh, some Bullet Club stuff. So, Last week we already talked about some bullet club stuff. <laughs> some more bullet club. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Last week on AEW Dynamite, uh Switchblade, Jay White, Rock Hard, Deuce Robinson cut a promo and uh declared that they are part of a bullet club gold. Um so they have uh started their own, you know, version of the bullet club here in America, part of AEW. Mm, very interesting. Um, I did not watch AEW this week, just like I didn't watch several of the other shows we're going to be covering <laughs> on this episode. Uh, yeah, I don't know. AEW Dynamite this week just wasn't on paper that appealing to me, although I did want to see Darby and Swerve. But other than that, the rest of the show was looking kind of mid. But uh, Bullet Club Gold, you say, they, New Japan owns the trademark on Bullet Club. I know that they're partners, but I wonder how all that is worked out from a monetary standpoint. Like, you know, I don't know. Is it like when you open, like, say, a subway? Is it like a franchise that you just pay them a, <laughs> a certain amount of money and you get to use their, you know, shit? Like, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's very weird. And I'll say it kind of plays into what happened at uh, Capital Collision, Collision in Philadelphia this past weekend. And I'll Didn't see, watch those either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> guessing it's, it's going to build something to Forbidden Door, possibly, but kind of weird that, yeah, there's a now a, a Bullet Club official, you know, a Bullet Club goal branch in AW. When we already kind of had a Bullet Club USA with, uh, you know, Chris Bay and Ace Austin in Impact. That's different. That's Bullet Club Impact. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, bro, I don't know. This is, it's a fucking mess. Um, and it's not, I don't know, for me, it's not that appealing, to be honest with you. And, you know, we've already talked about it so much. But for Juice and for uh, Jay White, I don't know that I, maybe I'm in the minority here, okay? But for me, I'm not that interested in watching them be the Bullet Club in AEW, right? Mm -hmm. um, i just rather see them both do fresh, new, exciting things 
in a new company with a new branding as opposed to like, I don't know, they, it feels like they're like the kids that graduated and they're showing up at the high school parties and still talking about like <laughs> yesteryears. Like what the fuck are we doing here? And uh, yeah, I don't know. But you know what? I will say this in their defense, they might be on to something because for instance, I was in a group chat the other day, right? And I won't name any names, but a friend of ours was like, Hey, how is Finley doing as the leader of the bullet club? You know, because granted I'm a little bit lapsed, but I'm finding it very difficult to accept him as the bullet club leader. And then I was like, quote unquote, friend, you having to accept him as the leader implies you're going to watch the product. (laughs) What do you mean? You're what do you mean? Accept him. You know, I think for a lot of Western fans, the bullet club is this um, far off conceptual thing that like they think is cool, but they don't watch the show. You know, they're fans of it, but like they can't wait for it to show up in America and appear on their wavelength where they're fans of other, you know, companies and shit, but they're not going to like necessarily get a new Japan world subscription and tune in. And for them, they just want to know it's off on its own doing well, you know? Right. So maybe they, there is an untapped market of bullet club fans, you know, that are here that have no real interest in the real quote unquote bullet club and they want their own version. So I don't know, maybe, maybe, for those individuals, this is a good thing. For me, I just think it's hokey and corny as fuck. Yeah, and we know that obviously the basis of AEW is built off of the success of the Bullet Club mm-hmm. when, it, when it had the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega and Cody Rhodes and Hangman Page and all those guys. Uh, obviously, that success, you know, spent into All In and it spent into the creation of AEW, and so we know that there is a group of diehard Bullet Club fans that kind of help start that promotion, and people are excited about it. And all those, you know, a lot of those fans stopped watching New Japan regularly once AEW started, and so right. I think there is a, a large fan base where obviously they know what Bullet Club is, and like obviously Jay White was pretty big when they were still watching, so now when they now that they're left and Jay's here. They're like, oh, yeah, Jay. We remember Jay White. He was a big deal when we were watching, and he was the leader of the Bullet Club, so he's the real leader. It is one of those things, too, where I, I every time we discussed Jay White's potential uh, leaving from New Japan, the question was like, well, what do they do with him? And, I mean, I definitely think that it was possible that he could have maintained the Switchblade character, in fact, very likely, but I, I just always had that feeling that both WWE and AEW might not know what to do with him next. Much in the same way it felt creatively, New Japan was struggling to figure out what was next for him. It, it for for us that were paying attention. I mean, the next logical progression was a babyface turn of some sort, right. which would never came. But we were sort of all like waiting for that phase of his run in New Japan. It just never arrived. So now it feels like he's there. They don't know what to do with him. We're going to break out this bull club thing. I don't know. Maybe they can cash in at Forbidden Door, like you mentioned. I just, I don't have any faith that the bookers from multiple companies are going to be able to cleanly and coherently and in a satisfying manner tell a, a story here. Um, New Japan hasn't even been able to do this on their own within the confines of their own booking as it pertains to the bullet club. And this is going on for a decade now. So I don't know how it's going to be expanded across at this point. Legitimately, we're talking about four or five different companies. It's because you've got the guys from PWA, you've got the guys from new Japan. Well, I guess really it's only four, but you've got two groups in new Japan, a group in PWA a group in Impact, and then a group in AEW. That's five groups across four companies. That's just too much. Like, there's no point. It's redundant. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Dave Finley was saying, you know, Bull Club goal, bootleg, Australia guys, they're out. They're not Bull Club. Like, he's been, you know, trying to trim down and kind of create his own version of his Bull Club. 
Um, so yeah, it's kind of weird with yeah, you having the book, the uh, you know the, the the real book club leader and Dave Finley saying like all these other groups don't count, they don't exist, but then you have all these other companies promoting them as they do exist. So it's kind of weird. Remember when there's a bunch of LIJ groups for that little bit there? There's like five different Gobernables. Yeah, there was like this is like that <laughs> CMLL version, New Japan version, Ring of Honor version, AAA version. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there was a bunch. Um, I don't know, man. I, I, they, here's the, the other thing, too. I haven't heard much about this. Like, this isn't something that I don't think has captured the imaginations of the wrestling fandom. It's not, like, all over Twitter and, you know, this big thing. I think, um, you know, there's that s- segment of fans that are happy that Jay White landed in AEW and not WWE. But beyond that, I don't know. Have you seen a lot of buzz for this? I don't think there is. Not really. I mean, it's just kind of like, all right, cool. Like, Jay's here. Bull Club Gold. All right. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. Like, this just feels to me that feels very limiting. Uh, but then, then again, maybe that just speaks to the strength of the Bull Club as a brand that people still want to continue to uh, <laughs> make money off of the T-shirt. And I guess that's cool. But yeah, one thing I was thinking. You mentioned all in and you know that how that was like the impetus for AEW. I never thought of this, but like is all in the real life sold out? Remember sold out from <laughs> NWO? Yeah, the NWO pay per view, yeah. I think all in is like a real life version of NWO sold out. <laughs> yeah. Just saying. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. We got a lot of questions about this, but I, I just have no I don't know. I don't have any interest. May am I being negative or something i don't know i know again i think it's different for us because we are watching new japan every week we're seeing what's actually happening with the bullet club their actual bullet club in japan and i think there's a disconnect with people who are only popping in and out and their their main product is AEW, and that's how they're viewing the bullet club well you know there are going to be people that look at it on paper and they're going to say well, you got a bull club in Japan led by David Finley who haven't watched anything since his, you know, turn. And then they're going to look at Jay White, the guy who's been the leader for literally the longest iteration of any leadership that there's ever been with bull club. Like he's at this point right now, the most synonymous individual with bull club period. And they're probably going to be like, He's the real leader, (laughs) you know, just literally just based off of like knee jerk reaction optics. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know if I'm new Japan pro wrestling. If I want that sort of thing out there, you know, the guy left, he signed with another company. I know, I know it's like a partnership and like they're working together, but I don't know if I want to cut the legs out from underneath my new leader in Japan who I'm trying to market undoubtedly as a Westerner to the, you know, to the United States at some point down the road, you would maybe want to make the bullet club name viable again for new Japan since they own it. And instead you're letting the guy that just left your company still represent that brand and to what end it's going to undermine the credibility of the bull club that you actually have going in your own company. I, I, I do understand that maybe there's that idea that like, Oh, that extra representation would, could somehow maybe get eyes on our brand, but more and more, it feels like the things that new Japan is doing in conjunction with AEW. you have to ask yourself, what is new Japan really getting out of it? And I have to argue and say very little, you know, I think that that's the case with the uh, Kenny Omega run right now very little of him holding the title and any title defenses he has in AW convert people to paying customers that are paying attention or viewing new Japan. That's not happening. Same thing with this. You're going to let them be bullet club. That's cool. Maybe you do a, I don't know, maybe you have a ready-made match for forbidden door, but I don't think forbidden door needed two bullet clubs to go head to head across companies. Anyways, it's not going to headline. It's not going to be the big draw but you are going to undermine your attempts to expand into America later on when you, you know, bring David Finley to the States again. 
Right. And that seems counterproductive. I don't get what the, the match would be. I mean, I guess you would do Jay versus Finley, but they're both heels. So, like, how's that? I, I would have assumed it would have been, like, unit versus unit, and maybe we'll see the, you know, Western Bullet Club expand. I don't know. Yeah. But, but then again, it does. Yeah. The question that you asked, what about Ace Austin? What about Chris Bay? Like, <laughs> how did they fit into this? Because they were both kind of brought into the Bullet Club via Jay White, but they're an impact. And they're not like working in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe they show up for Super Juniors. We'll know that in about like, what, 10 days yeah. from now? Yeah. But uh, as it stands, it's just really convoluted. Yeah. Well, I had a few questions here. Uh, Reddit user Solid Deuce says, should Cody recruit the Good Brothers and claim leadership of the elite gold? I don't think that elite gold would be his. They would have to be the club, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, they're the OC already in WWE. Oh, the original. Oh, yeah. So there was the club and then there was the original club. We had two different clubs in, in <laughs> WWE. <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, Reddit user Wiz Factor. How much creative input does Gato have in the Bullet Club goal stuff in AW? I can't imagine that TK would be allowed to book Bullet Club in AW unless both companies are working towards something big in the future. Um. Absolutely, Tony Khan would be allowed to book his contracted talent however he saw fit. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, as far as like utilization of, you know, um, Bullet Club Gold, as it pertains to like New Japan, I'm sure there's a collaborative effort on some level, but I, w- I would really doubt that Gato is telling him what, like, for instance, this coming Wednesday. It's Jay White versus Commander. You think like Gato's weighing in on the, the booking <laughs> outcomes of Commander versus uh, Jay White? Like, no, that's not happening. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, I'm sure there was some initial deal to to use the the Bullet Club branding, but as far as like how they're booked going forward, I I think until we get to Forbidden Door, there probably won't be any collaboration. Yeah, it's not like uh, <laughs> it's not like Tony Khan's gonna you know have Jay White job, right? And then Gato calls him like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not happening, bro. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, MJ does PR says, do you wish Jay and Juice dropped the Bullet Club gimmick when he debuted in AEW? Yeah, I don't even think they should be teaming together. It seems, I don't know. I, I said my piece, it's stupid. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind them teaming together. Obviously, you know, they were aligned in New Japan, but I think they they should have dropped the Bull Club, you know, logo and grouping or whatever. Like if they were going to team together, create your own thing, create your own group, and kind of move forward. So uh, moving on from that, uh, Aussie Open they defended the IWGP Heavyweight Tag Team Titles on Friday against the best friends on Rampage. I did not get a chance to watch this matchup yet, but um, you know, this is V1 for Aussie Open. We have a question here from uh, Rambo and Slam Pig. Are you surprised by how Aussie Open has gotten so over as of late, or did it seem to be inevitable once injuries, pandemic, and other extraneous circumstances finally were no longer in the way? They have been getting really great reactions in Japan and in their American appearances. Well, you know, I don't want to take anything away from Aussie Open because they are a great tag team. But realistically, getting over isn't always as simple as just being really great or having a good presentation. There's lots of great wrestlers that just don't get the same kind of like fan reaction or connection with the crowd. I I think it's a a number of things. Um, I would say probably the, the biggest part is uh, the, the matches that they've had, um, the buzz that they were kind of generating uh, just, you know, last year with like the Velocities matches and then the match that they had with FTR getting so much um, attention. And then uh, their connection to the United Empire is probably another big bolster because that platform really elevates them just like I think it has done that for everybody else in the group as well. So, um 
but then, you know, once you get, once you have the con- convergence of enough, like really good things and the right timing and you get them in front of the right eyes and audience, of course, they're going to get over like they're, I've been saying it for a long time. I'm just one of the best tag teams going today. Yeah, I think all the the right pieces have fallen in line for these guys right now. Like you mentioned being a part of the United Empire, also led by Will Ospreay, and Ospreay is, is super hot right now. Um, those guys are having great matches, you know, showing up on you know AW TV and having great matches there, um, and then everything they're doing in Japan, like everything is just hitting right now at the right timing for them. So big stuff for Aussie Open. That was just the start of their weekend. Um, that AEW appearance, which then takes us to the shows. Two shows that happened this past weekend. Uh, so first we had Capital Collision, uh, Saturday, April fifteenth on Fight TV. This was from the Entertainment and Sports Arena with an attendance of two thousand one hundred and seventy nine. Um, so overall. First of all, I guess I should say congrats to New Japan for having shows that were on Fight TV that actually started on time. You could see them and you could hear them. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I noticed, like you mentioned, they did a little over two thousand for the first show, and then um, unsurprisingly, they did around uh, nine hundred and some change for the Philadelphia show, and I think that really speaks to what we were kind of discussing last week, how like the first show on um, Saturday night was a lot more loaded just on a, from an on paper presentation. I think that speaks to, you know, when you compare the two shows, the first night was a lot more appealing. And I think that also is a big reason why it drew a lot more than the second night. Yeah. I'm not sure what the capacity is at 2300 arena in Philly, but they were saying it was sold out. Uh, standing room only there were people standing in the back so i'm not sure how they had it configured that i don't don't think that's accurate um i can check twitter but i was definitely keeping up with like the wrestle ticks Mm -hmm. and i mean there were still tickets available that you could buy they didn't i don't think they sold everything out but you know in today's modern age when they say like something is sold out that can have a lot of different meanings you know yeah so I know this show, the DC show, wasn't sold out. There were still like I think six hundred tickets left for the DC show. Uh, but for the okay, Philly, for you're the right. Philly, I was probably show, looking at that show. Yeah, I didn't see a wrestle ticks on the Philly show. Mm, okay, then disregard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that they're actually you know able to get these shows off without uh, any issues. But I will say the the just lighting of the show because it didn't sold out. You know the crowd. Well, they kind of darken the the crowd and just the overall look and feel of the show. It didn't feel like a major pay per view. Now it's kind of like remember when we were at the G one in Dallas and they had that super kind of like small stage setup. Like it wasn't like anything like big or grand. Like uh, you would think would be for like a G one show in America. That's kind of like what the setup was here. I mean, essentially, it almost felt more of like a strong TV taping setup lighting and production versus a you know a big pay-per-view kind of show that you would normally see you know something think back to like Madison Square Garden Supercard of Honor like it wasn't that level of production well I mean even um what was the most recent show that they, Battle in the Valley yeah um Battle in the Valley, we had some complaints about the presentation and some of the snafus with production, but once it got going, for the most part, it didn't look like, say, a major league production, you know, the way like AEW or WWE looks, but it looked better than, say, your average like impact or Ring of Honor pay per or, you know, in the past, Ring of Honor pay per views. Mm-hmm. Um, just because the capacity was much larger than some, some of the other like independent shows that you would typically see in North America. I'd have to guess just based off of what we're seeing here, based on the card and based on the attendance, like this probably didn't come across that way. Yeah. It just, it just didn't feel that way at all. It did, it did feel more almost like a ROH like TV taping kind of feel like the old ROH TV taping. Yeah. 
Which is like, okay, uh, that's fine, I guess. Um, if at the end of the day you're making money, that's great. Uh, I'm sure that they did well on, on the gate and the house and everything like that. They probably did some okay pay-per-view business. But the whole idea of this year and getting rid of Strong and everything was supposed to be quality over quantity. And my whole thinking was they're going to be running worthwhile meaningful major shows periodically throughout the year. Like not, you know, and in this case we got two shows back to back. And I mean, this is not WrestleMania 29, (laughs) (laughs) you know, on paper it's not. And from a size standpoint, it's not. And it's got me questioning again, why are we doing two shows back to back? I mean, I understand the economics of it. They probably are thinking like it's more, uh, beneficial to do the two shows since we're already in the market, we might as well make as much money as we possibly can. But that goes against the edict that they, you know, had announced to the fans when they said, we're not going to be doing quantity. We're going to be doing quality. And granted, there's a lot of news that did come out of these shows. There is some storylines that, you know, that is one thing that we have complained about in the past that these shows kind of felt, uh, superfluous like they didn't necessarily tie into the overall kayfabe of the company that's not really the case with these shows but at the same time like you want them to look major league even if they're not major league like you want them to to feel and seem that way and that's not what we got here yeah i don't think they brought over tv asai for this for these two shows like they did for battle in the valley um so. And that's another thing. Consistency is a very important aspect to your presentation. It's, it is frustrating and it, it probably, you know, just if I'm being blunt, one of the reasons I didn't watch these shows is I didn't feel the pressing, um, like pressure or, uh, like there was no impetus for me to feel like I need to put aside the other things going on, on in my life to tune in and watch these shows. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because every single time they do shows in Nor- North America, like there's either production issues or when there's not production issues, it looks low rent or it's inconsistent. And, you know, it, the shows are inevitably fun, but like, I don't know. Like, how did this look compared to, like, say, the Multiverse of Madness WrestleMania uh, weekend? I, I would say it looked better than that. Okay, a little bit better than that. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> low bar, but. <laughs> it is a low bar, but, I mean, that was a really incredible venue that they were in for that show. Mm-hmm. And you could hardly tell by the way that the production was. And that, and I, again, that's like a cross promotional thing. It's not, you can't put it all on new Japan. It's probably more of like an impact production, but I don't know, man. Like I don't think in 2023 you can be having these types of, if, if you want to run in North America and you want to run internationally, like you can't have shows that are good and then bad and then good and then bad when it comes to production, like it all needs to look seamless. I mean, for the most part, that's how new Japan is nowadays. You know, yeah. we don't even, they don't even do like the, remember the old days they had like the single cam shows and then the, the shows without with like just the two cams and, and no um, commentary. Like they don't even do that shit anymore. Yeah. It's like all, yeah. Full production. Even at least the smaller road two shows are having the full, you know, camera crews out there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then when you kind of compare that to like, say, you know, uh, I know this is a little unfair, but like when you compare new Japan's production across the board, including domestically against like, say pro wrestling, Noah, it's, it, it pales in comparison and pro wrestling Noah doesn't generate even a fraction of the, um, you know, income and, and, you know, money that, uh, new Japan does. Yeah. You would think that yeah, with how well new Japan and Bushi road does that they would have more into their production. I understand it's a cost. And I mean, I'm not like involved in the business of what they're doing, but like, there's a reason people think Noah is more successful than it actually is. And a lot of it has to do with the, the production of the shows. It, it looks like, the, I mean, their production is better than pretty much anybody's, including WWE and AW. It's kind of crazy. 
Yeah, I mean, perception is reality. If you, yeah, come off as a, a big time show, people are going to think, oh, wow, it's like a, a major league promotion. Yeah. Uh, so we'll run through the results here and kind of point out um, some of the story elements uh, that's happening here from these shows and the fallout. Uh, so the kickoff match, we had uh, the TMDK team of Bad Dude Tito and Shane Hanks defeating the West Coast Wrecking Crew, Jarrell Nelson and Royce Isaacs. This match was pretty much to kind of set up a little mini rivalry that was going to happen over this weekend. As later in the show, um, Tom Waller was going to ch- challenge Zack Sabre Jr. And then the following night, there was going to be a six-man tag team match. So that was kind of the story here. Uh, bad dude Tito picked up the win for the team after hitting a uh, flat liner uh, face plant maneuver. Gets the win and gets some momentum for TMDK. Then the official start of the show, we had Gabriel Kidd, the Jet Setters of Kevin Knight and Kushida, Speedball, Mike Bailey, and Bordor Jr. defeating the Chaos team of Chuck Taylor, Leo Rush, Rocky Romero, teaming up with Clark Connors, and the DKC. So <laughs> the big story... <laughs> what? They're still, they're still acting like the best friends are in Chaos? I mean, I guess they, they say they are. Uh, All right. <laughs> Uh, but the whole story of this match was if Voldor Jr. could pin Rocky, Rocky would give him a title match in CMLL. Uh, we know that feud's kind of been going on for majority of this year, and it seems like they've been really building angles between CMLL and what they've been doing in New Japan. What are your thoughts been on them kind of doing this kind of cross-promotion thing for this rivalry? I mean, I think it's really great, but it's also not something that I think is on the radar of your average wrestling fan in general. Um, But that's at no fault of the company. I mean, they can only do what they can do to try. I mean, for whatever reason, Lucha Libre is just one of those things that hasn't totally connected with, um, you know, like a U.S. audience the way that like Perezu has. And it's kind of strange because it's, you know, just across the border, mm-hmm. but uh, there is a kind of a barrier, like a tough barrier of entry to like actually tune in and watch the shows. I mean, you have to go to like a blog and follow all these crazy convoluted instructions, even just to find accessibility to CMLL and AAA. So it's kind of difficult, but um, I think Rocky's been doing a fantastic job really promoting his efforts down there. And it looks like he's having a blast and, uh, I know the first match that they had where he won the title is one of my favorite matches for excursion match of the year that we've had all year. And I mean, a big, I mean, they've done a series of matches, but most of them have been like multi-mans. We haven't gotten the big singles rematch between them for the title yet. And so it looks like that's on its way. And I think that's cool. I mean, I love the idea of them, um, cross promoting across multiple promotions, you know, title stuff like this. And uh, that's really cool. I just don't know if it's a, uh, something that is translating to the general fan. I don't know if, again, I don't know if they're, they're converting people into from watching new Japan or watching impact and then tuning into CMLL. But at the same time, I don't think it's as detrimental as some of the things we've seen between AEW and new Japan this year. Yeah, I definitely, you know, when these guys were in there, there wasn't as much, like, crowd heat for this long, like, blood feud rivalry that's been going on. I don't think people are fully in tune, but there is definitely some back and forth with promotion, these guys going back and forth between CMLL and New Japan. And so, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool that they've been uh, doing some cross, you know, promotion for that rivalry. Well, also keep in mind, Rocky's not a heel in New Japan. Right, I don't even know how many people are aware he's working heel right now. Right, which is also weird because yeah, yeah, he's like yeah, big heel in Mexico and CMLL, and he comes back to New Japan. And he's out, you know, shimmying with you know Chuck Taylor and Leo Rush. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, there's definitely a um, that's not uncommon. You know, that guys will work different um, gimmicks or, or different heel face alignments depending on what company they're in at that time. Yeah. So this is a really fun uh, opening matchup. You know, the, these uh, New Japan America multi-man tags are usually always pretty good. And yet a lot of great, you know, fast paced high flyers in here. So a uh, really good matchup uh, towards the end. Volador was able to pin uh, Rocky. So he will get 
his uh, title shot in the future. Uh, and then uh, post match, Clark Connors, he was frustrated and he beat up the DKC and left. So, uh, you know, commentary was shocked. Everybody's kind of shocked that Clark Connors did this. Uh, big turn, big turn attacked his uh, LA Dojo uh, stablemate in the DKC. Yeah, but I, the thing I got to ask you, Jeremy, okay, if if you were living in the dojo, don't you feel like DKC would kind of be the one you'd want to take your frustrations out on? <laughs> Doesn't he just kind of give off that vibe? Yeah. Like I don't really, uh, I don't really think that that means anything. Okay, like this, I'm pretty sure DKC had that coming for a long time. <laughs> it, it's been mounting. <laughs> uh, so then after that, we had David Finley defeating. AR Fox. This was AR Fox's first uh, New Japan of America appearance. Um, really good. AR Fox is incredible. Was flying all over the place. You know, great uh, 450s and Swanton bombs and uh, a really good matchup for Finley here. But uh, Finley was able to overcome all of AR's um, high flying and was able to get the win with the Trash Panda. Then uh, post match, he got on the mic and he called out Clark Connors and said, you know. This company has been overlooking you. They haven't been using you properly. Your own mentor, Shibata, is off, you know, getting his own championship opportunities, not getting you tours in Japan. Like, I know what um, potential you have. I'm looking for savages. I'm not looking for guys who can sell T-shirts, who want to be cool and throw up a hand signal just to be cool. Like, I'm looking for savages, people who are going to win championships, people who are going to be vicious. That's my bull club and then him and uh, Clark Connors throw up the two sweet, and Clark Connors officially joins Bullet Club. Couple quick questions. So, um, what was the fan reception to David Finley in the U.S. like after you know? Because it's the first time we've seen him since he really turned back at Battle in the Valley. Yeah, I mean, he was getting uh, big boos uh, yeah, throughout the whole match. The crowd definitely wanted Ar Fox to win the match. They were behind Ar Fox, and they were booing Finley. Booing him through his promo, they were chanting Jay White um, at him. Um, so definitely, mm. that audience was aware of what's going on in, in AEW. Interesting. Um, as far as uh, Clark Connors joining Bullet Club, I mean, I think that that's interesting because Clark is a guy that we we've been following since he first arrived at this company and. You know, especially the past couple of years, we've been saying they need to do something more meaningful with him. And going to Bullet Club is, it's an opportunity. But for most of the recent guys that have been brought into Bullet Club, Finley kind of, you know, he's an exception. But a lot of the guys that they've kind of just brought into Bullet Club usually doesn't do much for them at this point. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm wondering if this is something where it's like, okay, he's in the bullet club now and now he's going to become a rotating regular member of the Japanese domestic roster. And if that's the case, that's incredible. But my, my fear is like he does a a couple like random tours over there. Like he has been doing, and then he's still just relegated to the U S as part of like, you know, uh, Finley's bullet club, liaison here in the u.s like an la dojo guy still yeah it did seem like they were trying to position him as uh finley's like a right hand man so I'm, okay i'm hopeful for that will yeah lead for him to be doing some more tours i know super juniors is coming up so maybe he'll be in, in that tournament um but yeah i'm hopeful that this would lead to more tours in japan from a storyline standpoint um david finley had already announced that he had a hand-picked replacement for elp is this that hand-picked replacement or no? Um, I don't know. I mean, he said, yeah, going into the show, he had somebody. And then the following night, him and Finley, or him and uh, yeah, Finley and Clark were also scouting people um, in the Philadelphia show. So right. I don't know if Clark was the guy or if we're going to see more people joining. I get the feeling that there there is no guy, like just like there was no mall in chaos. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, if he, if he was, quote, unquote, the guy, that wouldn't really make sense. Because then why did he team with these dudes and try and then get frustrated and then beat up his teammate and then have to get, you know, the big come to Jesus talk from 
uh, David Finley the next match to convince him to switch sides if it hadn't already been decided. Like, narratively, that doesn't make sense, you know? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, maybe it's somebody else. Uh, but my feeling is, like, he probably is the guy. That, like, it just, it's not necessarily being, the story's not being told in the most uh, logical manner, you know? Yeah. Yeah, Finley, you know, he's saying, yeah, the Australia guys are out, so your boy, Liber Lucci. He made, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't, don't dismerge <laughs> Liber Lucci, okay? Caveman, uh, all those guys are, Finley's saying they're not Bullet Club. Well, he's going to have to talk to the tribunal, okay? He's going to have to talk to um, Prince Devitt. He's mm. going to have to talk to Tamatonga, and he's going to talk to the big man, you know? Underboss? The OG. Huh? The underboss? Uh, no, El, um, Luke Gallows. Oh, that big guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, he's going to have to talk to, um, you know, what? what's the guy's name he just said? Vale. <laughs> he's going to talk to Vale. He's got to talk to the founders and see if they approve it or not. Yeah, I mean, it kind of sounds like Vale's out, too. I'm not sure. How can Fale be out of the Bullet Club? <laughs> Dude, Finley's making changes. He He's getting rid of the dead weight. He wants savages. He wants killers. And he said, if you don't meet my standard, you're out. He should uh, bring Abdullah into the Bullet Club. <laughs> I mean, that's, a, that's that savage level right there. I think that's what he's looking for. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so then uh, after that matchup, we had the NJPD. NJPW World Television title on the line. Zack Sabre Jr. defended and defeated Filthy Tom Lawler. 13 minutes and 12 seconds. Also, we know that the history with these guys from the G1 and historic crossover. So this is kind of continuing that rivalry that started in Japan. One of the uh, best matchups of the night. Really, really good uh, technical match. And then especially... When it got down towards the end, these guys were just sprinting. Um, really great uh, submission and near fall attempts. Uh, but at the end, Saber was able to catch Tom with the seat belt and get the win and retain the title. Nice. I'll have to check that out. Good news. It will be made available for free because it's a TV title match. Yeah. Uh, then after that, we had Tomohiro Ishii defeating El Desperado. Uh, no real story for this matchup. A rematch from their uh, 2020 New Japan Cup match. Another great singles match. Awesome matchup here. Um, Despy got a lot of really great near falls on Ishii. There was one point where I thought he was going to beat <laughs> Ishii. Um, he almost hit the double uh, pinche loco. Uh, but Ishii was able to come back, hit the brain buster, and get the win. So then uh, following that, we had Rock Hard Juice Robinson scheduled to take on Fred Rosser. Uh, but going into this match, Fred had invited Juice's wife, Tony Storm, to the show. He had a front row seat for her, for, you know, a sign that said Tony Storm. Uh, so Fred came out first, and then uh, Juice jumped Fred on the roster Pile driver on the stage. Um, he took his belt off and he was whipping Fred Rosser um, and pretty much just beating this man all up and down the arena. Gets him in the ring. He puts uh, a bunch of coins in his hand, hits him with the left hand of God, and then he tells Rosser to keep his wife's name out of his mouth, Will Smith style. And they rule it a no contest. And Juice leaves this man, Fred, looking like a geek. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't have much to say about that. I guess the, the, this is the way that they wrote off Juice Robinson in kayfabe from the rest of the tour, essentially, the mini tour, the weekend. Yeah, and yeah, also there was no interactions with Juice or Finley with Juice being Bullet Club goal, so he was. I mean, he still wore the Rock Hard stuff and Bullet Club, but there was no interaction between him and Finley or Clark Connors. Well, I mean, so far on screen, they've had no interaction. I mean, it's assumed that they are on the same team just because back at Battle in the Valley, Juice Robinson came out, interfered on behalf of Kenta, and then later on, um, David Finley was like inducted into Bullet Club. You know, shortly thereafter. 
but we've we haven't actually seen them on screen together or interact in any way. So at this point, I think it's safe to assume that they're you know he's gold. That's an official thing, and then the regular bull club is Finley. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Doesn't that feel exhausting to like do uh, like a breakdown of this? You know. Yeah, like who's in what group and that's not fun. <laughs> oh man. But uh, following that, we had uh, just five guys, Sonata and Yoshinobu Kanemaru. They defeated Hiromu Takahashi and Tetsuya Naito. Uh, great crowd reactions uh, for Sonata. First time as just five guys in the States. And obviously great reactions for Hiromu and Naito. Ton of Daryls um, in the crowd. And we know we have an upcoming junior title match with Hiromu defending against Kanemaru. And then it seems like Naito could be a potential future challenger. And if Hiromu beats Kanemaru, he'll be the first challenger uh, for Sonata. So kind of building up what's happening in Japan here. Um, Kanemaru was able to uh, get the pin on Hiromu. So going into the title match coming up on April 27th on the Road 2 show, Kanemaru has a, a pinfall victory over the champion and it leads some doubt to whether Hiromu can beat Kanemaru to get to Sonata. And we had some questions here. Grunty Dot says, In 2020, Evil won the New Japan Cup, left LIJ, and beat Naito and Okada on the way to winning the title. His first challenger was Hiromu. Is Gato just redoing the same angle with Sonata in 2023 and hoping for a better result? Mm, I mean, somewhat. But I mean, at the same time, um, they they were both part of Lij. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like it's a little bit of a logical um, story to tell, and the fact that they were all Lij members, so they might have similar, you know, first, you know, if it's going to be infighting between the group. I mean, I think Hiromu makes a lot of sense for both guys to be their their first challenger or whatever. Right, and even though Sonata didn't like, you know, attack them or like turn heel, like these guys still, you know, feel a little bit betrayed and upset that he just up and left and started his own group. Um, so yeah, it definitely makes sense for them to, you know, start a few of these guys and build up to a big uh, Sonata and Naito title match. And at the same time, I mean, and maybe this isn't something people want to hear, but. Sonata is not being geared up for a long-term title run. He's being geared up for a cup of coffee title run, which is very um, historically normal for Gato's booking of a first-time champion. And even beyond that, uh, many of the bookers that, that operated in New Japan prior to, um, prior to Gato did very similar things. So, I mean, usually the first title reign in new Japan is like an establishing run for a few months. And it's highly likely this guy's not taking the title all the way through to the G one. With that being said, you normally want to put um, the champion, a new champion in there with somebody that they can beat, but also have a really great match, you know, mm -hmm. like in a stat, like for instance, this wasn't a title defense, but like, when Jay White first won his title, the first major match that he had in a singles capacity was at the anniversary show with the at the time junior Jay White or um Will Ospreay. Mm, yeah, and, and that was a you know a match that he was absolutely going to win because it's a junior and it's a guy that was from his previous you know stable, and it was one with where the worker was able to make him look like a million bucks. Same exact yeah. thing that they're doing right here. And, um, you know, I, maybe people can complain that it's a little bit lazy, but like, I don't think everyone, like, I don't think all the fans memory memories are as long as some of ours are when it comes to this sort of thing. I also don't think it's that egregious. And ultimately when the match happens, it's going to be awesome <laughs> because it's a Romu. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's my take. Yeah, it's going to be a great matchup. And, yeah, I think, yeah, five guys versus LIJ was the right kind of starting feud for just five guys. And if you are, like, one of those, like, 
LIJ like super fans or like, you know, people that really love Naito, like this is pretty much gearing up for Naito to be the next guy to take the title. And there's been so many fans over the past few years that have complained and been angry about him not getting a title run, um, befitting, you know, his status in their eyes. And this is going, this is the setup for that, you know? Yeah. Uh, next question here from Raising Falcon it says, in kayfabe land, maybe the reasoning why Sonata got a new finisher in Deadfall is to effectively counter Okada's Rainmaker. One of the very few people who actually has a positive record versus Okada is Jay White. Jay's Blade Runner finisher setup has proven a very good counter to Okada's most dangerous move, the Rainmaker. While trying to perform the Rainmaker, Okada leaves himself wide open for a devastating reversal. Into the Blade Runner, and this might be the reason why Jay White was such a good win loss record versus Okada. Sonata took notice and devised a new finisher with the same setup as the Blade Runner just to use this effective counter versus the Rainmaker, essentially eliminating Okada's most powerful weapon. This in turn finally gave the answer to beating Okada. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I feel like I've seen this, um, you know, this logic sort of uh, spelled out on the internet and a lot of people kind of speculating and thinking along the same lines as you, I feel like we've probably said something to the same effect as well. And even like Kevin Kelly has made mention of, you know, the deadfall being a counter to the rainmaker. So I think that's probably accurate. Then again, when it comes to new Japan, sometimes we're left to kind of fill in those gaps as a, you know, as an audience because they're not necessarily spelled out for us. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a great narrative to have, but it's not like Sonata has come out and said that yet. But it, it's good to think of, for like you said, the fans kind of come up with that on on our own. Uh, Raising Falcon also asks: Odds are sooner or later Sonata's dropping that belt to Okada again, the same way Jay White eventually dropped it to the same person he beat for the belt. So the question is: Are all champions transitional champions when Okada's involved, brother? I don't think. I don't think Okada's winning the title back from him, man. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's going to be Naito. It seems very much like it's going to be Naito because it's a pretty logical story. He left LIJ. They let him go. Now he got challenged by Hiromu, and he beat um, he beat Naito on the way to winning the title. And it's probably going to be something where like Naito's going to turn around and come to the aid of Hiromu after he loses. And he's probably going to say like, we let you go. You owe me one. And, he, and then he's going to be, and then Naito's probably going to be in for the title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then it's kind of like, all right, you, you really weren't ready. Like you, you, you won the belt, but you not quite at my level yet. Right. Like if you beat me once, but it wasn't in the big on the like within a big spotlighted match, you know. Mm-hmm. And if you really want to step out of my shadow, you need to like definitively beat me for the title, you know. And uh, I don't think he will. And then that kind of gives them some somebody to chase, and it gives them a nice little narrative. Um, the bigger concern, if you are worried about Okada and his position and role as it pertains to the main event scene. Him not having the title around G1 time could mean he's going to win the G1 again. <laughs> and that's how, seriously, and that's how we wind up with Naito and Okada at the Dome again. So, you know, we, we, I know that people like to complain and you can always find something to complain, but you kind of have to play like the, the long game what would the alternative be if I didn't have things like if you're looking at something to complain about, like your complaint is obviously okay. Okada might win the title back here fairly shortly. Well, what if he does? not mm-hmm. What's the alternative? The alternative is Okada could very well win the G one and then we're back at square one. And now, you know, but I bet you there's a lot of people that really would love to see Okada and Naito do it one last time in the dome. I don't know that I'm one of those people, but I've, I know they're out there. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I, I think that this match has still proven to draw, and so I, I think they could still they could make a big deal out of you know Okada Naito one more time 
in the dome, especially if you have Naito as the one going in as a champion and Okada going in as a challenger, kind of change up the dan- dynamics a little bit. I mean, them doing it that that last time at Wrestle Kingdom was enough for me, and then the trilogy that we got last year, like, I don't know that I need to see them ever do it again. And maybe we're just speculating and we're a little bit ahead of ourselves, but I'm just thinking, like, yeah, if Okada doesn't have the title going in G1, there's no reason he he, he might not win the G1. Like, <laughs> Right. I think without the belt, that makes him, like, a number one, like, early pick to win. Right, and... As much as I hate to say it, like Gato has shown this proclivity in recent years for doing back to back finalists, back to back tournament winners. Okada won it last year. He might just have him win it again. <laughs> right. And also, they, they want to make Okada like one of the greatest of all time. He's already won, what, running what, five times now? Four or five times he's won G1? Something like that. Yeah. So just add to the resume. But, you know, I feel like that's more egregious than putting the title back on him. Yeah. Kind of the same old like build to a main event with Okada as a challenger, uh, especially with like how how much it really felt like uh, Osprey might finally defeat him in last year's G One, and then he didn't. That was a uh, I don't know, kind of deflating in a way, you know. Yeah, yeah. Which I mean, it, it all worked out, but to turn around and feel like all right, we're doing another G One, and it might be Okada again. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I'd really love Osprey to be in position to win this year's G1, but I don't know how this whole Kenny story plays into that in the U.S. title. It doesn't, for me, it doesn't have to be Osprey. I don't know. I mean, that's the thing. There's so many guys that could hypothetically be. We feel like we're moving into this new, fresh, like, youth movement within the company, and it would be nice for it to be someone like that, but it, for them to go with the old hand and kind of run it back and it's Okada once more that just feels I don't know exhausting <laughs> yeah yeah I'd rather Okada be the champion you set up a new challenger for him with G1 right if if, if if we were just you know given those two options it's either Okada takes the title from Sonata and goes into the G1 as champion or he's definitely gonna win the G1 because he's not champion I'd rather him just beat Sonata. <laughs> I, I seriously, I'm I'm dead serious about that. I think that's the the better the better thing because at that point now you have an opportunity for somebody to not only win the G1 but also chase Okada and very likely beat him in the dome in a meaningful way. That feels more fulfilling to me than the more likely scenario that we're probably going to wind up with Naito and Okada in the dome this year. Yeah, it's very likely. So uh, moving on, the semi-main event, we had the strong openweight title on the line. Kenta defeated Eddie Edwards. Uh, a lot of history here at these guys from Pro Wrestling Noah. Eddie did some uh, tours there in Noah back in the day when Kenta was there. Um, so uh, all right matchup is very similar to what we've been talking about with Kenta where you, you get glimpses of that. 05 Noah Kenta with the chops and the slaps and the kicks, but then you also get a lot of the, you know, 2023 modern day Kenta with the ref bumps and the cheating and the shenanigans. And so uh, we got that here uh, towards the end of the matchup, and uh, Kenta uh, hit a low blow and was able to get the go to sleep, uh, hit, hit also hit him with the belt before that, got the go to sleep and pinned Eddie Edwards. After that, on the screen, we had a, a video message from Hikaleo, uh, and they already had a match set for uh, Wrestling Don Taku, but he challenged him for a uh, championship match, so we could potentially be seeing the strong title being defended in Japan for the first time. Yeah, um, I mean, there was a time and place where this would have been an all-time like Noah Dream match. I don't know if this show is one of those. Um, what did you think of the match overall? I mean, overall, it, it was fine. Um, I don't know. It's just, I, I think Eddie tried really hard, and Kenta was just went kind of back and forth between like trying to do some of the Noah stuff versus kind of being modern day Kenta. Mm. But yeah, so yeah, Hikaleo with post match challenge. So it seems like, yeah, the strong title will be on the line. Clown wrestling on Taku with Kenta defending against Hikaleo. 
Um, and so uh, we had a question here from uh, Let's Commission 7252. At this point, is it go away heat from Kenta? To me, it is because of how much of a talent he is still, but haven't delivered in his matches unless it's against Zack Sabre Jr. Anyone else he faces, he cheats and feels like a troll by having an actual fight, but then always cheats at the end. It's not House of Torture go away heat, but I can see him being the old Kenta, or at least the Kenta we got when he first came into NJPW and delivered in his G1 matches that same year, unless he breaks away from Bull Club or becomes a face. Well, you know, wrestling, (laughs) I know it's a cliche, but they say it's a tough business, and it really is a tough business. And, you know, one of the things that wrestling fans don't always acknowledge or take into consideration is, like, every bump, every match, it takes a toll on these guys, and we watch them year after year, and moment by moment, slowly deteriorate. I mean, there was the video that we shared earlier today where Will Ospreay was giving a health update and talking about the t- deterioration of his own health, even in these most recent years where people are saying he's an all-time talent, having the greatest you know work of his life, and he's talking about how he can't do the majority of the things he used to do and his quality of life is depleting, and his body is breaking down. And then you, you turn around and you look at a guy like Kenta, <laughs> who's well, well past the point of expiration when it comes to his prime years. And it just is what it is. At the same time, though, unfortunately, as as entertaining as Kenta can be on the mic and with his antics and as smart of a pro wrestler as he is, because he has really found a way to give a little bit extra life and and to his career and be entertaining. I I think we are at a point where he just can't do the things he, I don't even think he can do most of the things he did when he first got to new Japan just a few years ago. It's already gotten to that level. So yeah, I think a lot of people are probably not happy with him at the same time. You're not really supposed to be. He is a heel after all, but I don't know if in 2023, I find his matches to be that, compelling or entertaining i don't know if i want to uh call it go away heat but i would like to see a different champion and it's just one of those sad facts that the heroes that we love the guys that we idolize will one day not be able to perform the way that they used to and then you know it's like what uh brian danielson used to say the fans are fickle (laughs) you know but it is true like you know we're we're putting down the dollar for entertainment and these guys have to find a way to entertain one way or the other. And after a while, they just can't do what they used to be able to do. Yeah. I mean, Oh five Kenta is not walking through the door. (laughs) Oh six Kenta. Oh seven Kenta is not walking through the door. Um, And like you mentioned, his body is broken down. He had a lot of wars and Noah, he had the, the shoulder injuries when he went to WWE um, and then coming back, I mean, just recently that match with Tanahashi, he had big injuries from that match. He was gone like half the year last year after that match. He's sustained a lot of injuries and his shoulders not even fully healed from that WWE injury. There's still like some issues there um, with that scarring on the shoulder. So um, he's had his time. He had his battles and wars. And so I think for him, he's you know trying to cap- a capitalize on being a heel by using, using those antics and then also just kind of doing what he can do to get by. Um, so that takes us to the main event, strong open weight tag team title three way match and the IWGP tag champions, Aussie open Kyle Fletcher, and Mark Davis. They defeated the mega aces and the motor city machine guns to become the new strong open weight tag team champion. So now these guys are double champions, IWGP tag team champions, and the strong open weight tag team champions. Uh, this was a awesome uh, main event here. Really great stuff. A lot of great high spots, high flying. Of course, there's a spot everybody's talking about with Kyle Fletcher. Once again, going for that outside moonsault. This time, instead of hitting his head, he pretty much landed stomach first on the guardrail and it looked so painful. I'm just like, man, this guy is now over two on these moonsaults to the outside. 
Uh, but really great stuff uh, in this matchup. A lot of great um, double team maneuvers, great double team spots. Uh, towards the end, it was Aussie Open um, in the ring with Chris Sabin. They hit the big double clotheslines, hit the Corey Alice, and they get the win here. Uh, Post match, uh, Tanahashi and Okada you know, went face to face and seemed to want to challenge them for a strong title since they didn't get pinned. Um, so we'll see if that happens in the future. Uh, we had a question here from Les Commission 7252. How much longer until Kyle Fletcher injures himself permanently with those moonsaults on the outside of the ring? But in all seriousness, Aussie Open deserves their flowers as a tag team and singles competitors. But do you think we'll see each man in the G1 this year? It won't hurt sacrificing anyone from the NJPW roster to see these men deliver bangers during the tournament. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, that's definitely a good point. I mean, um, I don't know if you mentioned it, but Tanahashi got injured in this match. Yeah, he did. Um, so Tanahashi actually, a lot of people thought that Fletcher injured his ribs from that moonsault. But yeah, Tanahashi actually injured his ribs uh, in this matchup. It was hard to see exactly where it happened. But yeah, there was one point where he went for the high fly flow and he didn't even do the frog splash motion. He just kind of like dove off. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it's it's just one of those things like certainly is there there is a reason why they call big moves off the top rope, high risk maneuvers. Um, I can tell you I, in my wrestling training, I've never done a move off, <laughs> <laughs> off. Of, I've never done any moves off of the ropes at all. Um, but I've practiced them and I swear to God, there's, it's one of the most terrifying feelings being up on the, on a top rope being like, <sighs> All right, I'm, like literally every time I'm up there, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna just come down here. <laughs> <laughs> Even jumping onto a crash pad, it's fucking terrifying, and um, you know the the margin for error is very slim. But at the same time, um, guys that are coming off the top rope to the outside, they got balls of steel. That's something a lot of people don't give wrestlers credit for is the ability to do these high flying, death defying maneuvers to the outside, and yeah. We, we just saw Kyle Fletcher hit his head that one time, and I know that there was a mishap in this match as well, but that is part of wrestling. I mean, literally any move, any single move that wrestlers are doing has the potential for serious damage. I've seen someone blow out their le- their leg just by doing a forward roll, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, mean it, and, and that that's not that uncommon where something that's in – you know, something that you don't think is that consequential can actually have very damaging long-term effects. But the guys that are doing these moves to the outside, they're highly trained. They, they're very experienced with it. They're not, you know, they're not backyarders doing it for the first time ever. They, they know what they're doing. And is there a chance that they could get seriously injured? Yes, there is. But that's the case with the body slam. That's the case with the snapmare, uh, an Irish whip. It really doesn't matter what they're doing. It, there's always going to be that presence of danger uh, in the midst of it. Yeah, I remember a few years ago, Pack broke his was ankle on the baseball slide or whatever that was. We got hurt on that. <laughs> I don't even remember that, but I'm I'm sure. Yeah, I was in uh, when he's still in uh, doing the, the King of the Cruiserweights thing. Um, but yeah, so unfortunately for Fletcher, the the guardrails were, were really close to the ringside here, and so I'm sure he thought he had it measured correctly, but yeah, end up. Luckily, from now, it seems like he's not hurt, so good. We've seen people break their ankles doing moonsaults to the guardrail, so luckily uh, Fletcher was okay, was able to continue the match, but in a, a kind of crazy way, kind of, you know, harkening back to the match where he hit his head, like, he got hurt to the rail, that fired him up more, and then he goes on to win a title, so it kind of fit in for what's been happening with them. Um, so, yeah, they get the big win, double champions, uh, post-match crowds giving them a big you deserve it chant, um, and Fletcher says we know and talked about the great main event and um, you know being double champs being the best team in the world the crowd starts chanting FTR and Fletcher says that that's BS right there and he says that they run the world so it does seem <laughs> like they're angling uh, for FTR versus Aussie Open champs versus champs at Forbidden Door 2 I'm a little nervous about that um, you know I want to see the match again for sure, but when you have champions versus champions, I mean, is it going to be title for title? 
Um, I, I, I really doubt that it will be. And even if it is, I don't imagine if like, let's say hypothetically FTR were to regain the IWGB titles on that show again, are, are they going to come to Japan and work regularly on the tour the way that, you know what I mean? Especially if they're already AEW champions, that just seems like we're asking for disaster once again. Yeah. And even if it's non-title, the, the politics surrounding that are dubious at best. Like who's losing, who's going over, like what, you know, well, I mean, feel- FTR huh. beat them on a new Japan show in the first matchup. So I would think it's only fair that, Aussie Open gets to win back on the AEW show. Right, but that seems so unlikely. Like, I really don't see, unless hypothetically Tony Khan has, <laughs> unless, like, it's a, it could be one of several things. Like, the only way I see, a, like, the this tag team beating FTR in uh, AEW is, like, if it's punishment for all the, the <laughs> shit that they've been kicking up on their podcast and or dax has been pick, kicking up on his podcast and all that shit, like, maybe that's a, you know, um, you know, we're going to cool you off a little bit sort of thing. That's possible. Or, you know, I do know that they seem to be fans of uh, Aussie Open, and if they're, you know, trying to make any kind of overtures to potentially sign them, then maybe there's that, but... I mean, ultimately, with with it being champion versus champion, I mean, the more likely scenario than anything is like we go to like a no contest or like a double DQ or a double count out or, you know, a 1980 special. Yeah. 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 So I don't know. I, I, I struggle with wanting to see that match unless, you know, unless it's a situation where they're not both champions. That seems to convolute things. Yeah, I mean, you could have Aussie Open go over and because they'd be the champs to get a title match, and then you do a rematch on Dynamite or whatever. And FTR Tony Khan's going to let his champions lose to the IWGP champions in a non-title match. Like, I really don't see that happening. Well, if it's going to build to a title match where FTR defends the AW tag titles and then beats them, I mean, I could see that. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if history tells me anything, like, that's just probably not going to happen. Like, you know, um, New Japan's gotten a little homied by AEW almost every step of the way in their partnership. And I mean, it is a it is a case where New Japan's the B-side, especially on those Forbidden Door shows where it, it seems to primarily be booked by Tony Khan. I don't see him letting his champions lose for anything. Yeah, yeah I guess we'll have to see what happens going forward. But yeah, that's what they're teasing FTR, Aussie Open 2. So um, leading into the next show... Like you one other thing I did want to point out, I think with them holding both belts, uh, the idea or argument that the strong tag team titles become even less, you know, valuable or purposeful becomes more abundant at that point. Yeah, I think they should unify them and just yeah, I'll claim them as one, you know, one championship. Well, I mean, at that point, you just you just defunct the strong titles. Yeah, I think they should. Yeah. Uh, so going to the next show, um, like you mentioned, Tanahashi got injured, so he was pulled uh, from the show. He was supposed to be in the main event, and so that got turned into a strong title match of Aussie Open defending against Leo Rush and Tomohiro Ishii. And then also uh, TJP was off the card. He had traveling issues, and then uh, Juice Robinson was suspended and fined for his actions against Fred Rosser. And Fred Rosser took his place in the match against Lance Archer in the U.S. tournament. Um, so then the show kicked off with uh, El Desperado and Volador Jr. defeating Delirious and Kevin Knight. Uh, it's kind of a, a random high-flying opener. No real stories uh, with this matchup. Uh, second match, we had Alex Coughlin defeating Tracy Williams in a ROH Pure Rules matchup. So... If you're not watching ROH, uh, Alex Coughlin has been wanting to challenge Shibata for the Pure Rule title. So this was kind of a, a setup here to get you know Coughlin a Pure Rules win. This was a really good um, Pure Rules matchup here. Coughlin is a freak of nature with his power moves. Uh, ends up getting the the big win with a German suplex of over Hot Sauce. Uh, we had a question here from MDSPR. What's Alex Coughlin's next 12 months look like? He is super impressive and has some awesome power spots. He did well with Gabe in World Tag League. Could he be a Bullet Club target? 
I don't know. I don't know what to expect. Um, possibly, but you know, it feels like if in fact Clark Connors is truly getting the the full treatment of being brought in as a regular domestically to Japan, that's the first real attempt for them to, uh, you know, kind of incorporate one of the LA Dojo guys, you know, in full. And they haven't made that a- attempt with Alex Coughlin just yet, but I think it's long overdue. Um, but, uh, you know, I- I'm not good at predicting for a year what they will or should do with somebody, but I think it's long overdue that they get him in the mix because it- it's it's a waste of time and a waste of talent to just have him kind of out there working indies and showing up in the UK and that sort of thing. Like this is a guy that really should be a staple of new Japan. Yeah. And if they fail to capitalize it, we're going to get another Carl Frederick situation where either WWE or AEW is going to sign him up because he is super talented. Oh, by the way, I saw Carl Frederick's Friday night at uh, NXT in Largo. Did he, he wrestled? Yeah, Eddie Thorpe. <laughs> he wrestled. He wrestled. Um, um. Uh, God, what's his name? Apollo Cruz. Oh, and it was probably the best match of the night. Very short. Uh, they worked. Uh, it, their match was definitely a level above everything else I saw on that show. And um, but they didn't give Carl a lot. Like he he pretty much was just getting fed and bumped bumping like the whole match for uh, Apollo Cruz. The crowd didn't really know him, but they obviously know Apollo Cruz. So like the crowd was firmly behind um, Apollo. Um, they did let Carl do like a nice little comeback. So he got like a, you know, four or five hope spots down the stretch for a believable near fall. And then he got beat. So, but um, they worked really hard. They worked really well. Um, we, me and my buddies, we were kind of like joking. We we're like, it's a <laughs> Dragon Gate versus New Japan match, but um, <laughs> yeah, nice. And if people want to learn more about how Carl started in wrestling, we did interview Carl during the pandemic. So go back on the the archives, check out that uh, interview with Carl Fredericks. I was trying to go hard for Carl during the match, and um, my girlfriend's brother was with us, and he was like, "Do you actually like that guy? Or are you being like funny?" <laughs> Because <laughs> he didn't know if I was just being sarcastic, and, you know. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, no, I, I like Carl Fredericks a lot. And he's like, I thought his name was Eddie Thorpe. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's hilarious. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, I don't want every LA Dojo guy to join the Bullet Club, but I mean, at this point, it might be the only sure bet to get them in Japan. <laughs> But uh, so moving on to the next match. Uh, well, first, uh, Dave Finley and Clark Connors came out. Um, Connors wearing a Bull Club shirt now. Finley got on the mic and said he got rid of the dis- disloyal El Fantasmo last week, and he's upgraded by replacing ELP with Connors. He said, "If you're not loyal, oh, he is the guy." I guess so. Yeah. Um, and so he says, "If you're not loyal, you're gone." And he declared that my bull club is for killers and savages only. Hmm. Um, so this led to Clark Connors versus the DKC, which was added after Connors joined bull club and attacked DKC the previous night. So this was six minutes, 38 seconds, pretty quick matchup with Connors um, pretty much getting the better of DKC. He ended up hitting like uh, three or four spears um, to put DKC away. And uh, lots of questions here about Clark uh, being in Bullet Club. So, Les Commission 7252 says, It is nice to see Bullet Club be more than a faction that focuses much on pop. Is it nice to see Bullet Club be more than a faction that focuses much on popularity? By bringing in Clark Connors with his style of wrestling, he fits with the faction. With Finley's motive of making the Bullet Club full of savages, it's nice, clean touch instead of the same Bullet Club we have every year with no changes. That is the one thing I will say. I think that's it's good that we are getting something fresh and unique, even if the branding isn't changing the message and the, you know, the idea behind what it represents is totally different than what we've seen in any other iteration, which is nice. Yeah, it's like for the first time, I feel like the the leader is really kind of shaping it in his model and kind of bringing in people that he wants to bring in. 
instead of just kind of sticking them with whatever is already there. Yeah, the other thing too is like if I'm David Finley and I'm seeing what's going on and I'm realizing like, yeah, all these other brands are kind of undermining my push, I'm going to do everything in my power to differentiate what I'm doing to really establish it and get it over so that there's no confusion about what's actually going on, you know? Yeah. Okay, okay, 890 says, do you think Clark joining a faction and Kevin Knight having a title shot coming up means New Japan is finally going to start using the LA Dojo guys? It's a good sign, right? Yeah, it's better than what they've been doing before. Uh, Rambo and Slam Pig says, with Connors joining Bullet Club and you more are talking about leaving LA, do you guys think that we're going to be seeing more of that generation of wrestlers at the Japanese shows? If so, who is to be downcycled to make room? Well, one of the things they've been doing that I, I really do like is allowing the older wrestlers to kind of enter more into like a kind of freelance role, you know, and be utilized in other companies, but still maintain their connection to New Japan. And that does a couple few different things. It creates more space for the young up and coming wrestlers to be, be featured regularly in New Japan. It kind of gives them roster space, but it also kind of low key establishes a superiority for New Japan within the country domestically, because you're, you're sending some of your older stars to these, you know, smaller companies so that they can draw and be used to, and it, it actually it's doing, you know how like uh, I've been complaining on this episode about the AEW crossovers and how it's supposed to benefit New Japan, but it really doesn't. Mm -hmm. Well, in some of these cases, it kind of does actually, because you're sending the message that like our guys that we're sending are in a, in a way they're from the big leagues. They're kind of superior. You're actually drawing people to the smaller companies. There's a little bit more of like a, uh, you know, th there's a connection there and it kind of creates a, a little bit of a sense of community. And there can also be that angle, like they're kind of doing it with Nagata where it's like, he sort of has the title hostage. So he's kind of quasi proto heel and, you know, someone from all Japan needs to come take that belt back for, for them. And it's kind of cool. So th that's one thing that they've done. And, at the same time, we are seeing some guys down cycle. I feel like we're seeing the gradual descent of Hiroshi Tanahashi. We're seeing the descent of other people. And then some guys, like, for instance, Yoshihashi and Goto, they're primarily tag guys right now. Maybe that will change, but, you know, you got Suzuki. He's not so much involved in, like, single stuff. He's kind of, you know, off doing the, the trios thing. And I think that's another smart thing they're doing is sort of defining these different um, – you know, uh, divisions where in the past, a lot of the divisions were just, you know, composites of single stars that were kind of just used to further their singles angles and stuff. And when you actually have people sort of aligned to be in the tag and the trios divisions, that allows opportunity for people to come in as single stars. So I think they're, I think they're doing a few of these things, you know, differently than what we've seen in the past. Yeah, and also, yeah, there's a lot of older guys that are they are going to be down cycled. I mean, even guys like Tomohiro Ishii mm -hmm. are, are going to be down cycled um, to to make room for some of these young guys uh, coming in. Yeah, earlier we had that question, and someone asked about Aussie Open being in the G1, and I think that'd be great. I don't know how likely it is, but I I, I do think we're going to see a big shakeup in this year's G1, and I wouldn't be surprised if people that are involved in tag teams or in trios or are older or have terrible win loss records just don't make it into the 20 man field this year. Yeah. I know that there was a rumor like last year that was potentially like, like Ishii was on the, the chop block last year. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be really interesting to see who makes it in this year, which in a way like that would be the end of an era and it would be very sad of course, because I love Ishii in the G one, but at the same time, I mean, Suzuki kind of has already left the G1. I don't think Ishii is far from being in that same um, role. And then if you're not going to push him, you're not going to have him win it, you know? <laughs> right. I mean, from a kayfabe perspective, like he 
always has bad records or he's 50 50. So it's like, all right, why is the IWGP committee continuing to put this guy in his tournament when he doesn't, you know, barely gets four wins? And we're probably getting to a point where like his body probably needs the rest. Yeah. Um, so moving on from that, we had a uh, team filthy team, Tom Waller, Royce Isaac and Darrell Nelson. They I think did. Barry Walsh had one last question. Oh, yep. Skip that. Sorry, Barry. Uh, it says, does Clark's faction move increase the odds of Gabe and Alex joining a faction two and getting used more or decrease odds due to roster spades? Given TMDK seems an obvious fit to me, but best of super juniors is around the corner and Clark is a junior. So personally, I'm not sure if the other guys will soon be seen more any opinions I, I think that would be the next logical step to get uh, that's what they did with clark and it made all the sense in the world i think that it's been pretty much to this point mostly a failure um bringing over the la dojo guys to japan but not aligning them with a faction i think it's really hard to get over in new japan when you're not aligned with a faction unless your name's like John Moxley and you're from the WWE or you're like Mercedes Monet, <laughs> like it, it's not feasible. And for these young up and coming guys, I think that that's the best thing to do is align them with one of the factions, thereby creating connections to, you know, the characters that fans already care about. And it kind of gives them an in, it makes them more important. I mean, it worked wonders for Teton, a guy that's been in Japan many, many times for many tours. No one cared. Now he's part of LIJ, and everyone likes him. It's pretty simple. Yeah, we saw that with United Empire. I mean, Francisco Akira, incredible talent, but New Japan fan base really didn't know him. You add him to United Empire, he got over big and helped him a ton. You know, TJP was just kind of doing stuff here on Strong in the States. Again, add him to United Empire. Stock has risen, so... Yeah, I think definitely getting people into factions in New Japan does help them get over. Um, so moving on, next match, Team Filthy, uh, Nelson, Isaacs, and Tom Lawler. They defeated the TMDK team of Bad Dude, Tito, Shane Hayes, and Zack Sabre Jr. Um, so Tom was able to uh, pin uh, Bad Dude, Tito here. So able to kind of get a little bit of a revenge after losing to Zach the, the previous night and we kind of see this rivalry between TMDK and Team Filthy continue on. Uh, after that, we had just five guys, Sonata and Yoshinobu Kanamaru, uh, defeating Homicide and Rocky Romero, kind of a, a random matchup here, but a fun matchup. Uh, again, Sonata got a great crowd reaction Homicide, obviously being in 2300 Arena, Philly area, got a great reaction as well. Um, fun matchup with uh, Sonata using a O'Connor roll to uh, pin Homicide to uh, get the win here. Then uh, after that, we had the AEW International title on the line. Orange Cassidy defeated Gabriel Kidd, 11 minutes 52 seconds. Uh, we saw the story kind of continue with Orange Cassidy and his uh, hand being injured from Dynamite. So that was a target here uh, in this match from Gabriel Kidd. And a really fun uh, back-and-forth matchup here with uh, Orange Cassidy uh, getting the win over Gabriel Kidd, retaining his uh, international championship with the uh, the mousetrap roll-up pin. I saw a uh, the backstage comments, and he pretty much... Uh, Orange Cassidy... Uh, <laughs> pretty much like just cut like a, a very normal straight laced like backstage promo and i saw someone tweet and they said this man gave kid beat the the gimmick out of james cripperly <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i was kind of thinking that maybe gabe kid could have been a potential guy to join bull club uh finley and connor's were seen watching this matchup i thought he was gonna attack cassidy after the match but he did not and said he put the sunglasses on. He celebrated with Cassidy. So we'll see what happens with Gabe Kidd uh, going forward. Uh, then after that, we had Hiromu Takahashi and Tetsuya Naito defeating Chase Owens and Kenta. Uh, big, super huge crowd reaction for Hiromu and Naito. They got holy crap chance. And before the bell even rang, the, that's Philly crowd was just you know, big uh, LIJ fans, big into Hiromu and uh, Naito. Tons of Daryl dolls throughout the crowd um so these guys i mean they had to do very minimal and they were over uh throughout this match 
Um, so they defeated um, Chase and Kenta. And after the match, our good friend Rocky Romero came out and talked to Hiromu. And they played a video which revealed that the All-Star Junior Festival USA is coming to Philadelphia 2300 Arena. And it will be on August 19th, day after my birthday. Uh, tickets go on sale. They're on sale right now. Uh, prices range from $50 standing room to $300 ringside. And we had a question from Hawaiian Punch BB with the All Star Junior Festival USA officially announced. What are some names that you'd like to see if WWE sent someone hypothetically? Who would you like to see sent by them? Akira Tozawa isn't doing anything right now. <laughs> We, we always, I feel like we've answered this question on the show so many times about hypothetical WWE uh, people sent over, and it's always, you know, we always kind of say the same names. Maybe send Dragon Lee. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be nice, right? Yes. Uh, but realistically, like, who do you think our guys are going to be in this thing? Uh, you know, I don't know. Um, Starboy Charlie. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hey, 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 Starboy Charlie's kind of good, though. Oh, yes. I, I haven't seen anything recently, so, yeah, maybe I should uh, watch it for He's pretty I... good. He's, I mean, he's like 17 or whatever, but he's all right. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, in a perfect world, I'm anticipating, you know, guys from all the major companies, you know, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't, my finger's not on the pulse of, like, who's really great in the junior space at this point. I mean, if it looks anything like what we saw in Japan, it's probably going to be very good. Um, at the same time, I don't know. The, 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 the show in Japan was fun. It was like a novelty, but like if it, it didn't lead any, to anything for anyone anywhere, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And maybe it will. Um, but as it stands right now, there's been no follow up. Uh, of course, Best of the Super Juniors is coming around the corner, and that might be nice uh, for some of that uh, setup from the All-Star Junior Festival to bleed over into Super Juniors. But I'm hoping that the one that they do in August has more of a long-lasting effect, either giving us a look at guys that might potentially make the crossover domestically to Japan, or even if it's not that, that they can do interweave feuds and storylines and and programs and angles between the varying different companies whether that be impact or mlw or pwg or whatever you know what i mean mm-hmm. yeah yeah i think there's a lot of great guys that they can use i mean i'll see speedball mike bailey who was on this show this weekend uh blake, mm-hmm. blake christian a guy that they use uh frequently um then the other time i'll see chris bay ace austin the, the impact guy so I think we'll see a great collection. I'm sure there's a lot of AEW talent that could get sent over, especially some of like the lower tier guys, some of the guys from Ring of Honor. Um, you know, depending on how everything's working out, uh, maybe some of the CMLL guys too. Yeah, I'm sure. You'd be surprised. They can send over something like uh, Teton, um, Silverano, Mystico. You know, there's a couple, I'll have to get the names for you later, but I've seen some clips of some young guys that are coming up in the ranks of CMLL that like for the first time in a long time, it's looking like they have like some guys that are going to be the next guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like for a while now, it's felt like a lot of those really crazy, super impressive high flyers are, have been coming out more from like the triple a side of things. I seen some clips recently where I'm like, I, I forgot their names, but there's like two individuals specifically where I'm like, Holy shit. They're not far off from, some of the best Lucha Libre, like, luchadors out there right now, so. Nice, yeah, I'll definitely have to check that out. Um, so, yeah, so, big announcement there, um, and Rocky says, let's put together a good card, you and me, Hiromu. And, of course, Hiromu's, like, freaking out by the announcement. He's like, yes, yes, <laughs> screaming, so. Bro, I'm under 220 right now. The, hey. Science. I think that's the cutoff. Yeah, let's get, <laughs> let's get you in there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I know. Uh, I know. There's a tag team here locally. The 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 heavenly butterflies. They they probably pick up that phone call if Gato, you know, dialed them, or if uh, Rocky gave them a call. You know, you just slide their numbers in uh, Rocky's DM. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so after that match, we had a video airing of Kenny Omega talking about the U.S. title tournament, how confident he is because he's beating everybody that's in the tournament. Um, then they showed footage of Juice beating up Rosser the previous night, which got him suspended and out of the tournament, and then Rosser taking his place. Um, so Rosser came up. He was all taped up. Head was taped up. Ribs, arm was all taped up, and he came out for this match. And then Archer came out, got on the mic, and said, you know, we are in Philly. We are in the 2300 Arena. The fans chant ECW, and he says, you know, let's make this a Philly street fight, no DQ. Um, and Rosser agrees, and they grab kendo sticks, and it goes on from there. And get a wild brawl all up and down the arena. Uh, pretty violent matchup with Archer pretty much in control for the most part. With Rosser having to fight from underneath. But because it was uh, no DQ, Juice Robinson uh, came out and attacked Rosser once again, hitting him with that left hand of God with the coins in the fist. And then Archer was able to hit a big clothesline to get the win. Um, and the officials, they get Robinson out of there because he's supposed to be suspended and not uh, in the building. Archer gets on the mic and says, uh, Tony Khan's message for you, your elite puppies. You can't protect them that much longer. He says that he is going to uh, beat the winner of Tanahashi and Osprey and go to Forbidden Door 2 to beat Kenny Omega. So then that took us to the main event where the strong openweight tag team titles were on the line as Aussie Open defended against Leo Rush and Tomohiro Ishii. And this was a another great matchup from Aussie Open. And, I mean, Leo Rush and Ishii is just one of those teams where it doesn't seem like it, it makes sense. But also with them both being in chaos now, it was awesome having those two guys uh, teaming up together. And, of course, Leo Rush uh, working really great um, with Kyle Fletcher and Aussie Open. So a lot of really great stuff there. Um, and then towards the end, uh, they were able to hit the uh, Coriolis on Leo Rush to uh, get the win. And post-match, Fletcher uh, thanks uh, Philadelphia for being a great crowd. Say that they are the best team. Eat your heart out, FTR. We run the world. So once again, teasing that FTR matchup for Forbidden Door 2. Yeah, Um so it looks like they're they're heading that way. I, I was a little skeptical as to whether or not they would do that just because both teams are so hot right now. And well, I don't know if that's true, but both teams are in, <laughs> um, you know, such important positions within their respective companies that I didn't know if they could afford to do a match like that. But it seems they're heading that way. So very interesting. Yeah, maybe. You know what? Jeremy, maybe there is the sense that they do that that will be a big match on like because you know they have the Wembley show coming up, so maybe they do the first match. Aussie Open beats them at Forbidden Door, and then they lose the rematch in Wembley. Yeah, definitely a possibility for that. But then again, I don't know. I don't want to litigate what's going on in AEW because I don't know what other tag teams they might have in the rankings for them to, to dance with down the line. Um, part of me also feels like maybe they should be defending their titles at the big Wembley show against an AEW tag team. I don't know. Yeah. We'll have to see, but I do, I do think that, yeah, doing this kind of uh, trilogy with FTR and Aussie open would be um, some great set of matches and can do some great business. Nice. Any final thoughts you have about these two shows or any, uh, you know, I mean, overall, like you mentioned they're 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 these U S shows end up being, you know, fun shows to watch uh, You know, there are some really good matchups there. You know, if people want to cherry pick, definitely watch, you know, Aussie open versus Ishii and Leo rush the three way where Aussie open wins the belts. Um, watch Tom and, uh, Zach Saber jr. Um, Orange Cassidy and Gabe Kidd uh, was fun. Um, so yeah, I mean those are kind of standouts. I heard Despy and Ishii. Was oh very yeah, good yeah, too. yeah. Despy and Ishii, um, Coglin and Tracy Williams was a good matchup. So I mean, there's some good stuff on these shows, but again, they didn't feel major league. They didn't feel like they had a ton 
of consequences of what's going to happen in Japan. Also, the big thing, also with the bull club stuff, but everything else kind of seemed more kind of contained to what they're doing in New Japan of America. I don't know where the Fred Rosser Juice Robinson story is going, considering like there is no weekly TV and Juice is an, really an AEW guy. So I, I don't get it. Might not be going anywhere. It might have just been the setup to kind of write off Juice, I feel like. I, I guess, but I, I feel like it makes Rosser look like a geek. Like he gets no, mm-hmm. no revenge on the right. guy that beat him up twice. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> well, anyways, that's going to do it for coverage of the collision events. Let's um, jump into um, our preview for NJPW Road to Wrestling Dantaku, April 23rd from the Edian Arena, Osaka number two. This is coming up uh, here in about what, five days? Yeah. Just five days. Just five days. And we've got a seven-match card um, opening up the evening. We have a singles match between Oleg Bolton and Ryohei Oiwa. Is this the first singles match for Oleg Bolton uh, since his debut? I think so, yeah. And I know Oiwa was uh, who he did his first, you know, exhibition match against at Wrestle Kingdom on the undercard. So it's going to be interesting to see those two guys together. Uh, Any you know, big thoughts on that thing. I'm going to guess either they go to a time limit draw or Oleg's going to win. I would, I'm going to take Oiwa just cause he's the more senior guy, but it's going to be interesting to see what they do with bolts. And if they do kind of put him on a fast track trajectory, you know? Yeah. I feel like they've made him more of a bigger deal. They made a big deal about his first match, the whole exhibition thing. And so I don't know. I feel like they're really invested in him. I feel like maybe It'll be a little while before he gets his first win, though. You know? Yeah. That's my gut. Um, second match of the night, we have the Chaos team of Goto, Yo, and Yoshihashi teaming up with Yuto Nakashima to take on the four-man team of House of Torture. Uh, we do have a question here from Dr. Larry at the Dark. He said, House of Torture has proven to be an effective heal unit. When do you expect them to put the spotlight on evil again? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they're ever going to do another main event run with evil. I didn't really seem to, to work out the first time. I feel like the spotlight for evil is house of torture. I mean, they're, they're pretty much featured on every card. They're in some kind of program or angle. It's not obviously the main event program, but they're featured pretty much on every show. They're usually feuding with some top eight faces. So I think that is the kind of spotlight for evil right now. It's going to be very telling how they treat him in the G one this year. Yeah, that will, that will be like the big key indicator. Uh, third match of the night, the Jet Setters, Kevin Knight, and Kushida team up with Hiroshi Tenzan to take on the United Empire, Aaron Hanare, Francesco Akira, and TJP. This is a preview match for the Jet Setters in their um, title challenge against the junior champions, Francesco Akira and TJP. Yeah, I think uh, you know Tenzan being in their screams Peter to me. I, I feel like Aaron Hanare will get that, get that Ultima full Nelson on Tenzan to uh, get the win for United Empire. Fourth match, United Empire, Great Ocon, Jeff Cobb, Kyle Fletcher, and Mark Davis take on the TMDK foursome of uh, Kosei Fujita, Mikey Nichols, Shane Haste, and Zach Sabre Jr. And again, we have a tag team program going between um, Aussie Open and the two-man unit of Shane Haste and Mikey Nichols. Yeah, let's see. As far as who's going to win this, I guess we have Fujita on the TMDK side. So yeah, United Empire is probably going to get the win. Is Zack Sabre Jr. currently feuding with anybody over the title, or do we expect this to kind of be a setup match? So he's facing Jeff Cobb at Don Taku. It was announced as non-title, but now that he's beaten Tom Lawler, I think that it will turn into a title match. Yeah, and even though yeah, Jeff Cobb is involved in this match, so very likely they'll solidify that here. Yeah, Cobb will probably pin Vegeta here. Fifth match of the night, the Bull Club team of David Finley, Gato, Kenta, and Taiji Ishimori will take on uh, the GOD team of Hikaleo, Jado, Tamatonga, along with Master Wato. And we do know that currently Hikaleo has a date with Kenta for the strong openweight title, as well as David Finley is the next title challenger for the never openweight champion, Tamatonga. Yeah, so building up those feuds there, I'm wondering if there's potential for master Watto to join the bullet club maybe it feels like they 
have people like if I'm David Finley and like you mentioned, I'm looking around at the building blocks that are already there. I'm, I might be wanting to cut out some of these guys. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe, um, maybe he, yeah, maybe he boots uh, Ishimori or something. I don't know. Well, Ishimori just showed his loyalty. So I don't know about that. But. That's true. Yeah. Yes. And then the semi main event, we have the cast team of Okada, Ishii and Yano teaming up with Tanahashi and Togi Makabe taking on the strong style trio of Desperado, Suzuki, and Narita, teaming up with Umino and Tiger Mask. Yeah, I guess we'll have to watch out to see if uh, Tanahashi is going to get cleared to uh, be in this matchup, depending on the state of his uh, ribs. He might not be in here, but a uh, story here is Okada has to pick uh, two people to challenge strong style coming up. So it could be Ishii and Yano, or maybe they, they fail here. He, he needs to pick uh, two other people. Yeah, I, I feel like the guys that are in this match are the most likely um, picks for who he will decide to team with to go after the never open weight strong six man tag team titles, which uh, well, I call them strong. They're not strong. The six man, the never six man open weight tag team titles. But um, I never really expected Okada to be involved in any way with the never six mans. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of weird. So, it's kind of a weird detour, but uh, I kind of like it. It's fun, and you know, it's a it's a better alternative than him dying his hair red and walking around with pants and red balloons. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then your main event of the evening, we have the Lij team of Bushi, Hiromu Takahashi, Shingo, and Tetsuya Naito taking on four of the Just Five guys: and Doki, Sonata, Taichi, and Yoshinabu Kanemaru. And we do have sort of an ongoing feud between Lij and Just Five guys. Um, namely mostly revolving around the big match between Sonata and Hiromu Takahashi for the world title coming up. But in addition to that, Kanemaru is the next challenger for Hiromu's junior title, which they'll probably play into that as well. Right. And um, Kanemaru pinned Hiromu this weekend, so he has the momentum. And so, yeah, Hiromu has to kind of prove that he can uh, yeah, beat Kanemaru in this match and the upcoming title match on, on the 27th. Not to mention Tai Chi and Shingo have reignited their feud and uh, are battling over KOPW. And then you kind of got Naito and Doki off on the side um, doing a low-key build for <laughs> Naito's very likely uh, title challenge coming up after Dantaku. Well, there's also a match, a singles match with Doki and Naito on the 27th as well. So That's what I was alluding to. Yeah. Which uh, our like, boy, Doki, he's going to, you know, shock the world, <laughs> get the big upset. That's why I was saying it's kind of like a low key build to him challenging for the title. Like his tune up is Doki. Nah, Doki is going to win and, you know, kind of <laughs> elevate his stock and be ready for Super Juniors. All in all, though, this is a pretty, for, um, you know, a road to level show, the Duntaku tour is looking pretty stacked. They got a lot of great talent on the show. And even though not all these matches scream out as being blow away i think this is gonna be a fun show top to bottom and i think it's gonna be a good setup for what we've got going on the rest of the tour for sure yeah um after that the news so um there was an announcement this past week the return of all together joint event between all japan pro wrestling pro wrestling noah new japan pro wrestling uh it's been announced for june the three promotions on wednesday morning announced all together again which will take place june 9th at ryogoku sumo halls that's a big show yeah. Um, English and Japanese commentary will be available. It's going to air on New Japan World as a pay per view event for 3,980 yen. A portion of the proceeds are going to go to charity with details to follow. Tickets will go on sale April 23rd. So, yeah, what are your thoughts on this big uh, all together show happening since the last one was about 10 years ago? Um, well, you know, those shows came together because of, you know, natural disasters and, um, you know, the thing with the, uh, <laughs> I think it was the Fukushima, uh, or maybe it's not Fukushima, I'm actually forgetting, but there was the um, the nuclear plant leak that was really bad and everything like that too. So um, it's good that these groups are getting together and it's not necessarily being caused by a major cataclysm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, you know, kind of coming out of the pandemic, trying to like regain, I guess, the power of wrestling that they say. I like the idea that they're running Sumo Hall, though. Like, if you're going to run one of these big shows and get people invested, it's a good idea to do a big production on a big stage. Um, I don't know what to think as far as 
the matches, uh, very likely we'll probably see a lot of tag team matches. So it's just kind of one of those things where like, I think it's going to appeal to the wrestling fans domestically. I don't know. I, I might be getting a little bit, uh, weary <laughs> of all the crossover shows that don't lead to too much of anything, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong there. Maybe there'll be some really cool stuff that comes out of it. There was obviously the Okada Kiyomiya angle that came out of this past year's, you know, new Japan Noah show. So yeah, maybe we get the continuation of that here on this show. That would be cool. Um, in other news, uh, the use of masks at Japanese events starting May 1st uh, at Road to Dantaku in Beppu Bicon Plaza. The use of masks in venues will be left to individual discretion. Staff and wrestlers' um, mask usage are going to be also left to individuals starting on May 1st. So fans will be allowed to cheer and converse without masks at NJPW events, but Circumstances may lead to venues requiring masks in the future. Fans will be informed of any changes via New Japan's homepage or social media. So uh, looks like this is something that could change as time goes on. It's going to be a fluid situation. But uh, for the time being, it looks like they are lifting the ban on masking uh, in Japan. Yeah, it seems so crazy, <laughs> you know, living in the United States. And it seems, you know, COVID the thing that passed here. And they're still being so, uh, you know, precautious in Japan. Dave Meltzer reported on Wrestling Observer Radio that Mercedes Monet is in talks with Bushi Road about extending her contract for one more match. Uh, you know, we didn't cover it, but this coming Sunday is the big stardom show where she'll be defending her title against um, Mayu Iwatani. Mayu Iwatani. Why do I, if I don't see it in front of me, I forget names. Um, and I got to tell you, um, Jeremy, now since we're on the subject, I don't know if you've seen it, but she's really been in like uh, really been promoting heavily everything that's going on between her and Mayu for this big show. Her social media has been all stardom centric the past couple days. And we've been, I've retweeted a few things that I thought were really great. This is what I wanted to see out of Mercedes in her partnership with stardom pretty much the whole time. Right. Yeah. It's great. They're finally integrated her, integrating her in the stardom product. And yeah, he, she had that sneak attack. This past weekend on Mayu at one of the stardom shows, and they've been doing some of their press conference stuff where she's slapped Mayu there as well. So, yeah, full on heel here. Great promotion on Twitter of everything going on with the show. Yeah, the, the sneak attack was great. The po- the um, the angle at the uh, press conference was really awesome. I mean, I can't speak for all the Joshi fans, but you know, we're connected to. Uh, James Boyd of One Nation Radio. What's up, James? And he's been saying really positive things uh, and really receptive to their use of Mercedes in recent, uh, you know, recent weeks when it uh, comes to the the build to this show and the build to this match. And that's really great because that's what we've been wanting to see the whole time. Um, I don't know if you saw this, but Julia was interviewed by Tokyo Sports, and she said that she's angling to potentially do a double title match the the red belt versus the iwgp belt um and wants to fight mercedes that'd be interesting yeah i'm wondering if this one more match is gonna get her to beat mayu a lot of people thought she was gonna lose to mayu she could end up beating mayu and going on to face julia well if if hypothetically you wanted to end julia's reign but you still wanted to capitalize on her you could have her beat Mercedes that would really put her in a new stratosphere and she would have both belts and that would help solidify probably both titles. But then very shortly after you'd probably want to have her drop the red belt and she can still maintain her world title status as being the IWGP champion. And, you know, from there kind of go off. And I think that that would make a lot of sense, honestly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm going to definitely check out the, the show Sunday. I'm looking forward to it, and I think that that match is going to be really fantastic. Yeah, it should be a great one. Uh, Multiverse United returns for Whom the Bell Tolls following um, on from the recent sellout event at the LA Globe Theater. New Japan and Impact's next collaborative event will be held in Philadelphia at the 2300 Arena on Sunday, August 20th. So we're getting another New Japan Impact show. 
Yeah, so as they're doing that back to back, so the nineteenth will be the All Star Junior Festival, and the twentieth will be the Multiverse Show. So back to back shows in uh, twenty three hundred arena. Well, that, that definitely tells us that there's going to be probably a lot of collaborative effort for the All Star Junior Festival with uh, Impact. Yeah. New Japan Pro Wrestling is happy to announce a partnership with Foop, <laughs> Foop, football soccer shirt manufacturer Blacksmith Apparel. Nice. So probably going to get some cool uh, jerseys out of that. Oh, um, yeah. Maybe maybe they'll actually produce something I would wear. <laughs> uh, well, I'll take us uh, to the questions here. Uh, so first from Barry Wall, she says, I saw that Bateman was a trainer for New Japan in America. I assume he's therefore under some sort of a contract assuming he is assuming he is do you think using him in japan as a large menacing foreign wrestler would make sense he could fit into house of torture possibly i know they're they love evil tall foreigners so if you have one under contract does it not make sense to use him to the fullest um yeah i mean they didn't use they haven't used all the guys that are there training in the dojo in the past like scorpio sky was one of the trainers and he wasn't necessarily utilized outside of like the ring of honor partnership when they'd have some appearances but um you know i do like bateman i i'm i enjoy his work and everything like that and i wouldn't be opposed to them bringing him over i I don't know if that they need to but if they decided to do that i'd be welcome i'd be you know receptive Yeah, it seems like, you know, with them dropping strong, they've kind of dropped the stray dog army. Um, But, yeah, I think Bateman is a guy that you could bring over to mix things up. Again, I think you would need to get him a part of a faction to kind of help get him over. Uh, But, yeah, he's a good worker, and he could help mix things up. Uh, He also asks, uh, he says, was wondering who your favorite aces in New Japan would be. I know Josh loves Tanahashi, but would he be above Anoki? Any love for Hashimoto? Or who are both of yours favorite aces of aces? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I mean, I guess it kind of depends on who you define as being like in that real, you know, lineage of ace them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, for me, I would say probably my quote unquote favorite ace would probably be Tanahashi just based off, of when I've been fully watching New Japan, you know, I've, obviously I've seen matches of Hashimoto and Inoki and you know some of the other guys who were considered ace at the time, um, but you know, I've fully seen most of Tanahashi's run in his career and just how he's elevated New Japan. So Tanahashi would definitely be my uh, favorite quote unquote ace. I, I will say this: New Japan has never gone full bore with any individual that I didn't love. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I really think that that's something that they've, uh, that they can really like tip their hat to is they've always picked pretty much the right guy at their, at the different eras that they've had. But um, with that being said, there are some guys that I enjoy more than others. And this isn't like, for instance, I like just to kind of throw it out there. Like, Okada, no doubt, one of, if not the greatest talents of all time. But for me personally, he's not my favorite ace. Yeah. So kind of putting it there. I think, uh, in my opinion, and I feel like a lot of people feel this way, and if you look at historically, it kind of goes this way. It's like Anoki was the top guy. Then it drops to Fujinami. Then it probably drops to, like, Hashimoto. Then to Muto. Then to, like, Sasaki from there most likely we're looking at Nagata and then Tanahashi then Okada of all those listed my least favorite in terms of like their runs um and, and this is no knock on them it's this is just my personal preference I probably would be less keen on like say Muto Kensuke Sasaki and Okada i prefer like i'm more enamored with like tanahashi and hashimoto and anoki and fujinami personally yeah and also you know okada's a guy i've I've seen most of his run too and similar to you like i i don't really i wouldn't consider him one of my favorite aces just something about him that's just i don't know to me just kind of 
sometimes I always forget that he is like quote unquote the ace because you know obviously Tanahashi is still there and calls yeah. himself, calls himself the ace uh, still. Um, but yeah, with him, I just don't know what it is. Like, it's also he's one of the best wrestlers on the world, and he he's going to continue to have a great career because he's so young. Um, but I don't know. I, I prefer Tanahashi. <laughs> I enjoy Okada. I, I like him a lot. He he is one of my favorite guys. But you know, if we're just talking about the people I love, you know what the funny thing is too. Even with Fujinami, um, my favorite. I could even I could probably even point and say I don't even love Fujinami's ace run as much as like I, I kind of give him the pass because my favorite era of his work is his junior run. Yeah, the like, junior stuff was great. Yeah. Fujinami's junior work is like so fucking good that it, it's so good that like it elevates his top guy run, even though a lot of it isn't as good as it should be. Um, if, if you're asking me, like if I had to do a top three, it's going to be like Anoki, Hashimoto and um, Tanahashi. And I would probably put all three of them on my uh, New Japan Mount Rushmore as well. So nice. Uh, next question from Less Commission seven two five two. Do you guys think that New Japan will sacrifice some of their stars like Sho and Taguchi for other juniors and other promotions or freelancers like Volador Junior, Mike Bailey, Soberano Junior, Leo Rush, etc.? I'm not. Is he referring to like say the best of the Super Juniors or the All Star Junior Festival? Uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess Super Junior since that's uh, around the corner. Um, I, I don't, I don't think we're going to see too many of their domestic guys not make it into the super juniors. Yeah. I think both show and Gucci are guys that are, they're going to be in for sure. Um, now if he means sacrifice as of them losing, I mean, the Gucci will probably lose to some outsiders they bring in and show they haven't really been pushing heavily either. So I mean, both of those guys could be pin eaters in the tournament. As a, yeah, I wasn't sure if he was referring to them not making it into the tournament or if they were talking about eating losses. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd be happy with both Taguchi and Sho not being in the tournament, but they're definitely are going to be in. Uh, Puro Poppy asks, have you guys checked out much of the new ROH? Are you satisfied with the New Japan involvement compared to expectations when it was announced New Japan would play a role in the reboot? Side note, on this week's show, Alex Collin did one of the most impressive feats of strength spots I've ever seen. I recommend checking it out. I think he did the same spot on this most recent collision show in the Tracy Williams match, right? Yeah, where he's sitting down and stands all the way up with the suplex. It is very impressive. I have not checked out much of the Ring of Honor um, show. And like, let me just put it to you this way. There's so much wrestling out there. I and to me, Ring of Honor at this point is a zombie promotion. It doesn't. Re- <laughs> it's really just AEW light, and AEW is adding another major Saturday show, right? But I already don't watch Friday Night. I already don't watch Dark. I already don't watch Dark Elevation. I don't watch Being the Elite. I don't watch the reality TV show, and it's hit or miss when I watch Dynamite. Like I didn't even watch it this week, so. I'm not going to watch Ring of Honor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's hard, yeah, fitting Ring of Honor in a schedule with everything else to, to watch and keep up with. And like you said, like, there's just not a ton of buzz around it. Like, I know there are great matches happening on there. Like, I know Aussie Open was on there, and, like, obviously Claudio's on there, and Samoa Joe, and Mark Briscoe. Like, there's a ton of great talents on there having great matches, but it's another Two hour show. Some of the shows are, you know, are in Orlando, Universal. Some of them are like after the dynamite taping. So you have a crowd that's not like maybe not fully. That's strange. Those are weird decisions as well. Yeah, I don't get it. Yeah. And like you said, essentially, it does feel like AEW red and black. Like <laughs> it's almost like the whole bull club situation. But it's. Yeah. I'm sure we'll tune in. Um, in our you know endeavor to watch new Japan guys work on the outside, but I'm not going to personally tune into the show. Like I, I wasn't watching Ring of Honor like that for years, even when it was running. You know, I just kind of tuned in for pay per views, and that's probably what I'll do with this one too. Yeah, like maybe if the show was an hour, but another two hour show uh, to keep up with, like yeah, that's a lot. 
And as far as New Japan's involvement, I mean, I think it's nice and it's cool that guys have places to work, but the the level of involvement, the involvement, uh, the level that was rumored, it, it has not really been met at all. So yeah, well, I mean, TK came out and was like, yeah, you know, New Japan's going to be a big part of what's coming with RH and Honor Club. He said he had an announcement, and then there was no announcement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, after Wrestle Kingdom, there's going to be this big announcement on New Japan. It's going to help with Ring of Honor, and yeah, there's, there's none of that. But, I mean, yeah, it's cool that, I guess, you know, Shibata's, you know, wrestling weekly there, and uh, they're doing this whole thing with him and Coughlin right now, so I guess that's cool. Uh, next up, Lazy Binger says, with NJPW already having three Gaijin faction leaders in Osprey, Finley and ZSJ, do you think there's enough room for ELP at the top main event level? How would you rank current standings of these four wrestlers in the NJPW roster as well as their potential peaks? Yeah, I'm not going to do the peaks and and all that. That's a a little bit too involved for my taste, but I, I think it is a concern when you have a Japanese product to have this many groups headlined by foreigners um that could be a bit much you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and i like all these guys and i think they're all great but there is a limit to how many factions can be headlined by westerners in a japanese you know dominated product yeah unless you know this is their way of trying to you know build the western audience and trying to Get factions that can bring Western eyes uh, to the product. I, I see you trying to build that up and trying to be more of a, a global brand. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think all these guys are great. Uh, I mean, from a favoritism standpoint, I, I would I would probably be like Osprey, Saber, Finley would be my order there. Uh, probably including ELP, I'd probably go Osprey, Saber, ELP, then Finley. Um, and ELP is great. Um, curious to see what they are going to do with him. Um, cause again, he's a guy, we talked about the importance of being in a faction. He could easily get lost in the shuffle if he doesn't get put in a faction or ends up leading its own thing. Uh, next question from ethnic dystopian. When did you first begin watching new Japan? What brought you to the dance and why? How do you feel about it then versus now? We just did an episode like a few weeks ago. We, we covered our history with watching New Japan. I think we covered just how we started watching wrestling. I don't think we specifically talked about just New Japan. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to answer that question. I'm tired. <laughs> uh, I'll skip. The, I mean, the short answer for me is like, obviously, seeing New Japan guys in WCW growing up and then. As I get older, you, you know, you watch TNA, you're watching Ring of Honor, you see all these Japanese guys coming over, um, and you learn about them that way. And then also, New Japan World becomes more accessible with New Japan, and uh, kind of dived in. I mean, I started watching probably like that 2012, 2014 era, but it was only big shows, pretty much only like Wrestle Kingdoms, maybe Dominions, and then uh, full time watching New Japan starting with this show in 2017. After being fed up with WWE, yeah, I would say my fandom is very similar. Some of the bigger differences, I think, I was probably exposed more to New Japan at an earlier stage than Jeremy was, and then um, probably was accessing it more regularly earlier, like you know, than than he was. But ultimately, I feel like both of our like devout watching of it coincided with uh you know with the show essentially yeah uh dark soldier do you see anderson and gallows being fired by wwe again in the next batch of budget cuts that is sure to happen and do you see them crawling back to new japan Mm, i mean anything's possible but um you know, most of the redundancies that are going to be involved with these two companies are not going to be centered around talent. It's going to be centered around other aspects of the new combined company. But if they have, uh, you know, huge contracts that aren't worth paying them, of course, they could be let go. And yeah, I mean, New Japan is a place they could end up landing. So, 
Yeah, I mean, they are still good friends with Rocky Romero, and I'm sure that, yeah, he would be happy to to bring them back in and, you know, they, they could start their own, you know, Bullet Club version. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bullet Club talking shop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Dark Soldier also asks, is it me or did the ending segment of Sakura Genesis was it completely based on the ending segment Devitt and Okada had right down to the heavyweight champion able to get his friend a junior title match? Um, I don't know about that. Yeah, I, I don't I don't remember which Devitt Okada match he's talking about. Well, they had several matches. Um, you know, they had a major match at the anniversary show junior champion versus heavyweight champion prior to the bullet club turn. And then later on, they had a few big matches uh, after the bullet club turn one for the title and, you know, several G one matches. So, uh, but I'm not sure about what segment he's referring to. Yeah. Uh, Hawaiian punch BV says, do you think Hiroki Hiroki Goto being stuck in another six man tag match of house of torture for his anniversary show is the most goto thing ever. Um I mean I guess so. That's one thing we were talking me and Jeremy were talking about this like the <laughs> last week you read off the entire goto um anniversary show card and you know one thing I try to do to keep on top of everything I have a daily planner and I write out each show off of the new Japan world schedule. And I was like, I don't remember there being a 420 show. And then, like, sure enough, I looked and I'm like, they're not airing this show. <laughs> so more so than it being a House of Torture thing, like, the fact that his anniversary show is not being aired is the most Hiroki Goto thing ever, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I would give you this big anniversary show. Oh, cool. When's it airing? Oh, uh, <laughs> about that. <laughs> um he also asks, uh, who's your pick for Javante Davis versus Ryan Garcia? Javante Davis gets hit. Ryan Garcia hits hard. He always has a puncher's chance. That being said, I'm fully, fully invested on Tank Davis winning this pretty easily. I think he's levels ahead of Ryan Garcia. And I think if Ryan Garcia beats him, it will really be shocking to me. Really, really shocking. Nice. Uh, let's uh, move on to the uh, recommended match of the week. Um, so last week for the recommended match, I recommended uh, Goto versus Nakamura from Wrestling Dontaku 2015. Yes. So um, I watched this match, and last week when you recommended it, I was thinking, I was like, why is he recommending this match? I like don't remember it. Did, did something happen? And then like I realized like, oh yeah, <laughs> they had like a huge series of matches in 2015 over the IC title. This is the match where Goto defeats Shinsuke Nakamura to finally take the IC belt off of him. And at the time when this took place, like people were shocked, like not because Goto wasn't like a player. Cause he was, but like, Nakamura was like at his zenith at this time, and it was like they had Goto <laughs> beat Nakamura for the for the for the white belt. Like this is fucking crazy. Um, I think the match is good. Um, you know, the first fifteen minutes are probably more so about like building uh, the match, and then the final five minutes really give you a satisfying payoff. Um, I, I think the, the build is a little too slow for my um, taste and both guys were holding back. And I, I don't know if I feel like they gave their best effort uh, in terms of like the, the matches they had in that series from that year. I think this is one of the lower ones. I think the fact that Nakamura was losing the belt probably has something to do with some of that, <laughs> but um, it is a, it's an important match historically. I mean, it was a big deal at the time that um, Goto beat Nakamura but um, yeah, I'd probably go like three and a half. Dave loved the match at the time. He went like four stars. It's got like a seven point five eight. I'm not as high on it as other people are. I think it's got a really great closing sequence, and um, some of the the near falls at the end are really great. There is a uh, top rope Ushigroshi 
that's really fucking insane. And then uh, uh, at the end, Goto hits the Shouten Kai to, to beat Nakamura, which was a big, big deal. But I think I prefer some of their other matches in this series from that same year. Um, specifically when um, Nakamura re- re- regains the title, I think is a better match. Gotcha. Yeah, well, maybe we'll check that one out uh, coming up. But it, even if this isn't like, say, a match of the year contender, it's a really good match, and I'd highly recommend it. If you haven't seen it, it's worth checking out for sure. And it's probably one of the biggest um, achievements of Goto's career. I mean, you know, Goto did other things, obviously, like, you know, he challenged for the world title several times. He won big tournaments. He won the G1. He won New Japan several Cups. New Japan Cups. Yeah. But I feel like this was like in the modern era, probably like one of the, the biggest victories he ever got over a major star. Uh, then for the excursion the match of the week, you chose for me to watch uh, Will Ospreay versus Tomohiro Ichii. From Rev Pro Uprising 2022 uh, from December of last year. And uh, this was a awesome matchup. No surprise here. Um, Osprey was uh, replacing uh, Ishii's uh, original opponent. And yeah, this was a great match. I would say it wasn't uh, quite what I was expecting maybe. Obviously, it's Osprey and Ishii. I feel like if this match was in Japan, it probably would have had a more big fight feel and they probably would have done crazier stuff um but it, it was still a great matchup um osprey was overpowering ishii um for the beginning portion of the match kind of out striking uh ishii and um also using kind of mixing his power with the quickness using a lot of ranas to the, the cross body dive to the outside to ishii but of course in typical ishii fashion he he fires back and there were several spots in the match where like he would literally just be standing in front of Osprey, and Osprey would have to throw as many strikes as he possibly can to try to get an advantage on Ishii. Uh, there was a crazy um, stalling superplex spot from Ishii to Osprey uh, from the inside. Uh, that was cool. Um, Osprey was hitting a ton of hidden blades in this match. There was one hidden blade spot where Ishii kicked out at one. Uh, that was great. Um, he had like a, a, a running flying. Uh, hidden blade, uh, got a near fall, um, and then eventually um, he got him up for the uh, Stormbreaker, got the win. So, really great matchup. I'm, I'm going four and a half. I think Dave went 4.75. Um, I know it's highly rated on cage match. Um, I thought it was a great match, but I wouldn't say it was like that four and three quarters, five star level. Like, I feel like they were holding back because I think, you know, obviously Will was on vacation getting ready for. Tokyo Dome, and I think they weren't ready for, to have like an epic, you know, classic matchup, but it was still a great matchup. Nice. So, um, for recommended match of the week, um, I am going to take it back to July 18th, 2016, the first night of the 2016 G1 Climax Block A action, and we are going to watch Hiroshi Tanahashi versus Sanada. Mm. And for context, this is, you know, Sanada had just joined the company earlier that year as a member of uh, Los Angeles de Japón. This was his first ever G1 Climax, and he'd only had one other singles match in the company up to this point, which was a losing effort at Dantaku versus Okada earlier in the year. And uh, this would kind of be his coming out party, the match with Tanahashi on the first night of the 2016 G1. And it's a great match. I watched it live at the time, was really into it. I haven't seen it in a number of years, but um, I think it's probably worthwhile to go back and take a look at it in light of his status in the company right now. Nice. Uh, Then for the excursion match of the week, we're going to go to Impact Wrestling's Rebellion and pay-per-view that happened this past weekend. The Impact World title was vacant and on a line between Kushida and Steve Macklin. Oh, yeah. I heard Kushida didn't win the title. <laughs> he did not. <laughs> yeah, we should put that in the news, but uh, they put the title on a dude named Macklin? Yeah, you, you buried him last week and they went with, they went with Steve. Bro, that's horrible. <laughs> 
But I, I heard it was a great match though on cage match. It's like eight point two six, I think. Uh, so people definitely think it's in that you know four star, four and a quarter range. So uh, could be a potential uh, candidate here. All right. <laughs> Well, uh, that's going to wrap things up for us here this week. Uh, next week, we'll be back to discuss the road to wrestling Don Taku and cover all the latest news. So if you enjoyed today's show, please consider making a donation. Visit socialsuplex.com slash donate and click on the donate button under the Keeping It Strong style logo. Make sure to connect with us on social media. The show on Twitter is at KI Strong Style. Follow the network at Social Suplex. And you can follow me at Jeremy L. Donovan on Facebook. We are Facebook.com slash Social Suplex. On Instagram at Social Suplex. On Reddit, I'm the pro black guy. Y'all just keeping a strong style. You can email me. Jeremy at socialsuplex.com Check out our Discord server The uh, Social Suplex Podcast Network Discord And check out all the other shows that we have here On the Social Suplex Podcast Network One Nation Radio hosted by Rich Latta and James Boyd We have the Grave Consequences Podcast Hosted by Caleb Baldwin and Maserati All Things Elite With Floyd Johnson Jr. And Austin Sumowitz The AEW Match Guide Podcast hosted by Sir Sam Brown and the Great Match Generator hosted by Danny Kukler. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and review and we will catch you next week on Keeping It Strong Style, the ace of podcasts. It's your bun. Thank you for listening to Keeping It Strong Style. We'll see you next time.